All right. Welcome, 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 everyone, to another Sunday of When Black Women Gather. For those of you who don't know, I'm Helen, Miss Higgy Higginbotham. I am the founder and um, I guess creator of When Black Women Gather, but it's nothing without you all. You all are what make it successful. And I just have to share with you, I miss, um, we are into two years of doing this. Our first online gathering was on March 22nd, 2020. It was with 20 women who were just cooped up in the house from being in COVID. And we decided that we wanted to, I know I was going to stir crazy. So I sent out an email and said, hey, who wants to get on? And let's just see each other's faces. Remember, we were stuck in the house at that point. And um, 20, I think it was about 20 women who showed up. And our first call was at 6 p.m. We said that was too late. And somehow, anyway, here we are, two years and how many weeks later? Um, over 100 of these recordings. <laughs> and I just want to say it's uh, no success without you all. So I think uh, if you're able, unmute yourself and give ourselves a round of applause because when Black women gather, what happens, y'all? Amazing things happen. <laughs> We're going to get all y'all to say that in unison. When Black women gather, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. And welcome. Amazing. So, yeah. But anyway, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to bring um, the co hosts on. Can you all help me with that? Bring each other on Spotlight. Let me see. Uh, we have uh, Kilthia Roberts. We have Michelle Burgess, and we have Angela Wyatt. Okay, everybody's here. So I, I'm always saying every week that um, I'm encouraging. I don't have to do this every week. You all have ideas, just please present them to me and let's make it happen. So this week, I think Kilthia came to me first and Ms. Burgess is coming at me at the same time. I'm like, okay, let's just, I put them together and they put this together with Ms. Wyatt. And today's topic is um, Black women's mental health and anxiety. They're gonna look specifically at anxiety and depression. And they actually have come up with a series of, I think three more presentations that they wanna do on mental health. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm actually gonna sit in the background today and let them do their thing. Um, and um, I just wanted to say that we are recording. If you're not comfortable with being recorded, please let us know if you wanna speak, we can uh, stop the pause, we can pause the recording so that your um, private statements or whatever you wanna make that you're sensitive about is not recorded. This is a space that's safe for all of us as black women. Um, you know our rules. There are no um, inappropriate questions. Um, we just ask that we guarantee you respect, but we cannot guarantee your comfort. But in regards of the sensitivity of this subject, comfort is an issue. So if somebody's uncomfortable with anything, please, you know, just let us know. Um, what else did I need to tell you? Oh, we will be doing a poll. We'll, be, we'll have three questions that are a part of a poll. Just so you know, um, the polls are voluntary and they're anonymous. So we don't know who said what. All we know is that 50% said this and 30% said that. So, um, and you don't have to participate, but we would like for you to. Um, they're innocuous questions. They're not asking you anything personal about yourself. Um, so um, I think that's it. I am going to hand it over to my co-host. Of course, I'm here in the background helping out however you need me. You guys tell me. And I'm going to remove myself from Spotlight and you all take it from here and thank you again. And anyone who's in the audience who has an idea about a program, please come to me. I'm working on some stuff. I'm trying to get Sonia Sanchez to come back with us, hopefully next week. So put out some prayers for that. Um, and um, so we'll be talking more at the end about things that are coming in the future. So um, I'm out. So you all do your thing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're going to put the question out now, right, Helen? Yeah. I absolutely can. Go ahead. Do your thing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so our first speaker for today is Ms. Michelle, I'm sorry, Ms. Chanel McCord. And... Um, Chanel is the CEO and clinical director of Oasis Wellness Group. 
Um, she's a licensed professional counselor in the state of New Jersey. She's an approved clinical su supervisor and she is a minister and she's an author of Jumpstart Your Journey to Mental Wellness, Strategies and Tools for Living Your Life, Your Well Life. And she is going to um, post that information about her book in the, uh, in the chat room so that you can see where to get it. And, uh, and we're going to get started. And um, Chanel is also a doctoral student. So I'm going to let her get started. Chanel has to leave early. So she's not going to stay. Those of you who are familiar with us know that these calls can go on for a very long time. So now she cannot stay for a long time. So if you have questions during her presentation that are burning and specific to her, please um, go ahead and put them in the chat room. Thank you. Ms. McCord, go ahead. Oh, hello, ladies. Um, I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, first, I want to say thank you for inviting me. Um, if anybody knows me, um, I live and breathe mental health. I love everything about it. Um, and being able to share on this topic is really my heart passion and what I feel like I'm called to in this earth too, right? Um, uh, Ms. Roberts did share that I'm also a minister, so I do believe that I'm called to this work. It's not just a work that I do. So um, it's in my veins, if you will. Um, and I also want to thank Lisa Powell for recommending me for this opportunity. But I want to make sure that I use my time wisely, um, you know, in talking about this topic of mental health in Black women. Um, there's a lot that I pondered on sharing today, but I did just want to cover a, a couple of things. I want to have a heart talk with you ladies today, if you will, a heart talk with you all about us learning how to handle our mental health and a messaging that we've received throughout our lifetime. I could give a lot of statistics and stats and all of that. Um, I choose not to do that. Um, I wanna talk more so about how this messaging of what it means to be a black woman and take care of you and how it is portrayed throughout our lifetime. I'm a big person who I love to talk about um, um, our generational trauma and understanding how things in our early life affect us even to the point of where we are. Um, and one of the things I write about in my book is toxic messaging. And a lot of times throughout our life, we receive toxic messaging. That toxic messaging is either through verbally the things that people say to us. It's also, as my pastor would say, some things are caught and not taught. So it's the things that we see and we perceive, whether it's in our family, whether it's through society, we receive these messages. And then in general, we can look at media, right? We can look at television and the images of how Black women are portrayed and, and what is seen of Black women and how Black women should or should not take care of ourselves. Um, I've also had the opportunity to sit on, you know, I take many classes as it pertains to like culture and different things like that. And all of this is intertwined in how the Black woman is seen as this, um, what do I wanna say, the superhero, right? We've heard of like the superwoman syndrome. And a lot of times the black woman is seen as the superhero who we can handle anything. Anything comes our way, we can handle it. And, he and here's the thing, I wanna give a shout out to us really quickly. The reality is we can handle a lot. The reality is y'all, as black women, we can make some stuff happen, but we have to have a fine line in understanding how to make stuff happen and knowing how to push forward in life and knowing how to make life happen and survive and knowing when we need to take a step back and recognize that we are human. And I think one of the things that is missed oftentimes is our humanity. Um, I love to talk to us in general about embracing our humanity because some of these toxic messages that we receive throughout our lifetime would have us to believe that we are above humanity, would have us to believe that we are unbreakable. And a lot of times what happens, especially as a lot of Black women I counsel, if we have a moment that we deemed, and I put this in quotes, as weak, right? If we have a moment that we deem as weak, it shatters our life, then, then we feel unworthy. And so I want to have this conversation with the ladies on this call today. And I want to let you know, first of all, that you are worthy just because you are. 
Somebody drop that in the chat for me. You are worthy just because you are. You're not worthy because the work that you do. You're not worthy because you're a wife. You're not worthy because you're a mother. You're not worthy because you made some great community impact. You are worthy simply because you are. And that is a message for many of our Black women that we need to behold. My worth is not based in the things that I do. My worth is not based in what roles I hold. My worth is not based in the positions that I hold. Your worth is based on simply because you are. And one of the things that plagues us as Black women with our mental health is because we equate our worth with a role. If I'm a wife, then I'm worthy. Or if I'm a mom, I'm worthy. Or if any, uh, if I have a, if I have a, uh, uh, amazing career, then I'm worthy. And if any aspects of these of our lives are missing from us, what happens is we start to have a breakdown in who we are. We don't know who we are. If 2020 hasn't taught us anything, life can change like that. Life can change for us in a blink of an eye. And so what I saw in 2020, as far as trends in mental health, is prior to 2020, um, I've been in the field for 10 plus years now, and I've had my private practice for, has been open for four years now. And yesterday, I actually just celebrated my one-year anniversary of being a full-time business owner. So I praise God for that. I took the leap and became full-time. But Within that transition of 2020, from when my practice first started, my practice was predominantly, I served predominantly white women. When 2020 hit, that completely changed. I didn't change marketing. I didn't change my branding or any of that. That completely shifted. And now my case flow is 99% Black women. Now, an uh, aspect of this, I praise God for that. And I'm super excited for that aspect because that means that as Black people and as Black women, we have gotten to a point where we're like, okay, I'm going to take my mental health seriously. But what's most alarming to me is the trend for the reason why many Black women started seeking mental health. And and the trend was, was because jobs were shutting down, because we were isolated, so we couldn't be around certain people, church was shut down. There was an identity crisis that happened because the roles and the things of who we are and what we're used to doing was not there anymore. So a lot of Black women no longer knew who they were. I want to present to you today that you are a human being and not a human doing. And so for so many of us, we're so used to doing that we're identified by the things that we do. And so for a lot of Black women, the, the identity crisis and depression and anxiety was all a part of that, but it was an identity crisis that many Black women went through. Realizing also at the point of the pandemic, realizing at that point of not being fulfilled not living, recognizing that I've been working a job, I was doing a whole bunch of stuff, but I was never fulfilled in what I was doing. And so we are in a time for Black women, like, I, like this is our time, y'all. Like, if y'all hear nothing else I'll say, like, this is our time, because there's an entire shift that is taking place right now in the Black community. I'm going to say we're Black men too, but for our purposes with Black women, there's a shift taking place where we're starting to make sure that we are repositioning. That's what I want to say. There's a repositioning and a realignment of identity within the Black community amongst our Black women that's happening, where we're starting to make sure that we're getting involved in the things that make us happy, and we're getting involved with the things that make us feel like we're living a more fulfilled life, rather than just being stuck in survival. If anything, if I have seen anything else, Black people, we get stuck in survival mode. We know we do what we got to do. Can anybody identify with that? Like, listen, I'm going to do what I got to do. Mm -hmm. We always say, I'm going to do what I got to do. Don't worry about it. No matter what happens, I may cry through it. I may huff and puff through it, but I'm going to do what I have to do. And at some point, we can respect the fact that we do have to do what we have to do. But when we talk about getting our mental health together and we talk about getting self-care together, we have to shift from a survival mentality into a mentality of living a fulfilled life because survival will always come with limiting beliefs. Survival will always have us living in a box when we were meant for abundance. 
Now I told you I'm a preacher, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to go all the way there, but when I, I can't separate mental health from that aspect, we were called to live an abundant life. We were called to live a fulfilled life. And so when we are stuck in survival, it limits us from being able to do that. It causes us to shut down our mindset. It causes us to, I may have big dreams and I may have something more for myself, but because of limiting beliefs and because what I've been used to, and because of that generational trend transmission of language, that generational transmission of trauma that has been passed down through our lives, what has happened is it has called us to continue to live in a box. Anybody ever heard that story about the girl who would watch her mom cook and her mom would cut off the end of the ham? And she would ask her mom, why are you cut off the end of the ham? And her mom went, I don't know. I don't know why I cut off the end of the ham. So she was like, you know what? I've always watched my mom do that. Let me call grandma and ask her why she did it. So she called her grandma and grandma said, you know what? I have no idea why I used to cut off the end of the ham. I used to watch my mom do it. So she was like, you know what? Let me call your great grandma and ask. So she called her great grandma and asked. She was like, why did you cut off the, the end of the ham? Because we've been cooking like that. And I have no idea why she did it. Grandma said, because we just didn't have a pot big enough. So I had to cut off the ends of the ham so we could fit it in the oven. So many of us are cutting off the ends of the ham of our life, or cutting off the ends of the ham of our destiny, or cutting off the ends of the ham of things that belong to us because of what we've seen and not because it actually fits your current lifestyle and where you are currently. We have to rework our lives to look at what fits me now. What fits my current reality? Where am I now? What does fulfillment look like for me now? What does self-care look like for me now, right? And not to say the things that we have learned through our grandmoms and our moms and all of that isn't important, but some of us are cutting off the ends of the ham for no reason. Some of us has gone through generations wasting good meat. Come on, y'all. Some of us have been wasting good meat for generations because of something that we've seen. Just because it's always been done that way doesn't mean that you have to continue to live your life that way. And so one of the things that we have to do as Black women is we have to learn to reposition ourselves. We have to learn to reposition ourselves for what does life look like for me now? What do I want out of life? Some questions to ask yourself. What have I been doing all my life and I'm unhappy with it? What is causing depression for me? What triggers my anxiety? And when you find the answers to that question, then do something about it. You do not have to continue to do things the way they've always been done because that's all you've seen. And so a part of that, something that people don't talk about when it comes to mental health, a part of that is exposure. When you are exposed to something different, you see something different. And a lot of us have to get outside of our communities. A lot of us have to get outside of our current circles. A lot of us have to look at something different and get involved with something different so that we can see something different because we can see more. One of the things I see all the time with the people that I counsel, the black women that I counsel, is that they're used to the four, they're used to the four blocks of where they live. That's it. So they don't see a different kind of lifestyle right? They see the same kind of people. They're around the same people with the same kind of survivalist mindset. When we talk about mental health, when we talk about depression and anxiety, one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to expose yourself to some different kind of people. You have to get into rooms and you have to get into circles with people who think differently, who act differently, who live life a little bit differently. Now, here's what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about flipping the script. I'm not talking about turning your back on your family. I'm not talking about doing any of that. But when you get around and when you're exposed to something different, it helps you to realize the fallacies in your own thought processes. We only know what we know. And so for many of us, what has happened is we've normalized the trauma in our life, right? I am, I'm from the Bronx, New York. And so growing up all my life, I currently live in Jersey, but growing up all my life, gunshots were normal to me. Like, I, like it just, we lived across the street from a very dangerous part. And so every night, bet your bottom down when I was hearing gunshots. That's how I went to sleep. Gunshots put me to sleep. When I moved to South Jersey, when my family, my parents decided to move to South Jersey, when we moved to South Jersey, I couldn't sleep that night. It was so quiet. There were no gunshots. It was just, I, I was convinced that somebody was sneaking in the house or something because for me, gunshots were normal. And so at a young age that my trauma became normalized. 
I became, it became normalized trauma for me. And many of us are living in such a way where the things that we've always seen, that we've always done, our trauma has become normalized. And so until you are exposed to something different or get yourself in therapy where somebody can help you to see like, hey, this is not normal. This is something that we have to work on. And so exposure is another aspect. Exposure can be from traveling. Exposure can be introducing yourself to new people, getting a part of different social groups or whatever the case is. But exposure can also also come by way of therapy. Being able to have your therapist sit in front of you and kind of reflect back your thoughts to you and kind of let you know like, hey, what you're thinking, what you've been saying, this thought process, there's something wrong with it. We need to work on this. And so one of the, so, so I said a lot in a little bit of time and I want to make sure, Ms. Roberts, you can let me know. I think I'm over time. Um, but what I want you ladies to know more than anything is that there is more for you. And in this climate of mental health, when you get your mind right, you change your life. Change your mind, change your life. That is a guarantee. I am seeing it every single day with clients who are literally having a transformation because their mindset is shifting, right? And that could be something as simple as learning your normalized trauma. That could be something as simple as learning what are those toxic messages that I have. And so what I don't know, what I don't know, and I also tell people all the time, what you don't name, you cannot treat. A lot of us walk around, we don't want to seek therapy or different things like that because we don't want those labels. We don't want it to be named. And I get that. I get that 100%. But what we don't name, we cannot treat. When I name it, there's a specific treatment that I can put along with that to target it. And that treatment will look different from everybody. And I'm sure um, Dr. Erica will talk about that in a little bit or whatever the case is. There's different types of treatment for everybody. So it's not going to look the same. But we have to make sure that we are at the forefront of our care. We have to make sure that we stand up in our humanity and we do what we have to do to take care of ourselves. Because contrary to what people want to believe, okay, Black women is important to this country. Okay, black women. Okay, they say this country was built on the blacks on the backs of blacks, and that's true. And black women was at the head of that, right? They need us, but we have to meet, make sure that we are well for the sake of ourselves. Because what we don't want to do, ladies, is we don't want to we don't want to be the ones who are then transmitting that toxic messaging throughout the generations. We have to make sure that we take care of ourselves. I like to say it this way: it's healing me to heal we. When I heal me, I literally heal my community, but it has to start with me. And if each of us make the decision to start with me, we can do amazing work to make sure that we heal our community at large. And so um, I think my 10 minutes is up. I probably went over a little bit, <laughs> um, but I hope that I hope that this information was a blessing to you ladies. Um, all of this that I just talked about today, it is in my book. Um, I did drop the info for uh, my book in the chat. So if you wanna go ahead and get that, I'll also drop my information about how to contact me on social media. Um, if you ladies want to follow me, I'm always giving out good mental health information. But thank you so much uh, for allowing me this opportunity today. Thank you so much, Ms. McCord. That was wonderful. And that was a timely word. We really needed that. Um, I did find one question in the chat room. And it was, um, I'm just going to kind of summarize it. Are churches more open to discussing slash processing the mental health needs of congregants? Have you seen a change in that area um, since uh, since uh, COVID? So yes, absolutely. Um, and that's actually one of the areas that's a heart passion to me. There has been a major shift. I'm not saying every church has got it, right? Um, because everybody is in a different place on this mental health issue and what is mental health. And are we diff are we just talking about mental health or is it spiritual or whatever there is? But I'm grateful because I actually do a lot of work with quite a few churches and with pastors. And I know my church in particular, my pastors push therapy, they push the conversations of mental health. I actually do a lot of talks at my church. So there are some churches. Is it every church? No, it's not. But just like with everything, um, it's not going to be 100% participation wherever you go. But we have made strides and we have made steps. I think what makes the difference is we the people. When we the people stand up and we say this is something that we want and this is something that we're important to us, all systems, no matter what that system is, is going to be forced to change. So I think the more that we speak up and we talk about how this is important to us in a church context, 
that it will, I don't want to say force, but it will encourage uh, more churches to make sure that they get on board and do more because churches really should be at the forefront of this mental health movement because churches do serve communities in a wide capacity. Thank you so much, Ms. McCord. We thank Before you. Before we so let much. her go, I know that you're in New Jersey, but with everything being um, um, online, um, are you able to see clients um, anywhere? So unfortunately, no, our licenses only like attorneys, our license only work in a state where we are um, actually licensed that. Um, however, I do offer wellness coaching, mental wellness coaching. And as a wellness coach, I am able to do that anywhere. I'm not limited by that. So it looks a little bit different than actual therapy, but that expands my ability to be able to do it anywhere. Okay, thank and you. I guess, and I guess my question would be, are you open to new clients at this point? either for therapy in New Jersey or for um, coaching anywhere? Absolutely. Um, I actually have two therapists that work with me in my office. So I have a group practice. So we are able to serve, uh, you know, some more clients. And I definitely have some availability for the wellness coaching. Great. Thank you so much. But before okay. we let her go to, let me just share with you the results from the first poll. Is, mental, is your mental health as important to you as your physical health? 59% um, of you answered at the time it was, um, I'm sorry, 59 people were on the call at that point, 62% of you answered, and overwhelmingly you said yes, 97% said yes, 3% said no. So as the day progresses, we'll have to see who lives up to that. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, how do we take that serious? I think that was the question I put in the thing in our, in the email notice, do we take care of ourselves? So do we really check in with ourselves to see how well we are doing? And I hope that we do give our mental health as much, um, um, attention as we do our, our physical health. And you all let me know when you want to do the second, um, question. And um, just so you all know, apparently it only stays up for like a minute. So you have to, if you're going to participate, you have to participate. And I need to fix that for the next time, but I can't because we're in it. So you all, um, and when I say you all, I'm going to share the results, right? So you all should be able to see the results, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you all, um, when I say you all, I'm talking about the panel. Um, if you guys just let me know when you want to um, throw in the next question. And I'm, I'm out of your way again. So. Okay, I'm gonna hand off to Michelle. Okay, uh -huh. thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm going to introduce Dr. Erica Jaraza, uh, MD, MPH, DFAACAP. She is a double board certified child, adolescent and adult psychiatrist, a certified yoga instructor and a cycle instructor. She is a graduate of Spelman College and completed her doctorate of medicine as well as her psychiatry residency at fellowship training at Duke University School of Medicine. She also completed her master of public health at UNC in Chapel Hill. She has experience in treating psychiatric conditions such as anxiety disorders, mood disorders, eating disorders, trauma, neurodevelopmental disorders, and psychotic disorders. There's more to her background, so please see the bios that came along with the email. And without further ado, help me welcome Dr. Erica Jarasa. Hi, thank you so much, Michelle. That was beautiful. Thank you. And oh my gosh, I just want to thank you. Um, thank Chanel. That was amazing and very hard to follow a pastor uh, with that much passion. I'm just, um, I am rejuvenated and excited to talk about this topic as well, because I've been doing this the majority of my life as well. Um, you know, started my child psychiatry residency way back in the early 2000s. So I've been doing this for a while and now I have a private practice and do a lot of consulting and speaking engagements. Um, but really my heart is in making sure we are talking about mental health so that we can break down stigma associated with it. And so we can really make sure people have the resources that they need to get their mental health needs met. And I'm so excited that 97% of you treat your mental health as well as you treat your physical health, like that's as important to you as your physical health. We got to work on that 3%. So hopefully by the end of this talk today, the 3% of you will say, okay, yes, I need to prioritize my mental health. It's my opinion, just like we all have a primary care physician. I think everybody should have a therapist. Imagine, Excuse me, may I say but, something? Yes. Sorry. 
I, I think I was the one because I just stepped away from my um, <laughs> computer to answer a very, take a very important call. Oh, and it's okay. I did not see the poll. So please, I'm putting up my hands. My answer is yes in capital letters. Okay, thank you. wonderful. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Thank right. you. Thank you. <laughs> and I wasn't trying to call anybody out because the reality <laughs> is we've all been there where we don't prioritize our physical yes. or our mental health, right? Yes, so yes. I think it's important to have these conversations. Absolutely. And I'm so excited to be amongst all these women today, um, all of you Black women who are having these conversations, gathering together um, as a graduate of Spelman College, all women in college. I think sisterhood is so important and that's what helps my mental health is making sure I have a sisterhood that's helping me to just keep it real with me. So um, with all due respect, I'm going to hurry up because I know we don't have much time, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can do a little bit of a slideshow. I'm going to breeze through these slides, and hopefully you all can see. All right, can everyone see? And if um, those of you me. I'm may sorry. have muted, if somebody needs to um, mute themselves. What's my name? Can you mute yourself? Oh, yeah. oh Deanna. De 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 oh, yeah. I didn't see. Oh, yeah. It was, it was funny. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Um, someone needs to mute themselves. I'm trying to figure it out. But yeah, we should wait a couple because this. What's what's her name? Who's here? Is there a way? That's Miss Johnson. Um, wait, wait. I'm hold on. Stop sharing your screen. You know her, Shetty? From uh, Montessori Hall, of Montessori School. Wait a minute. Um, they have no idea that they're. <laughs> The fatigue, I'll just. Um, and you all, uh, Linda, I know you can't. Who is it? Oh, I see. It looks like it's Tawana. Uh, okay, the way you can tell is whoever's box is lighting up, that's the person. So. I, I couldn't find it. <laughs> okay. I just found it. I just found Erica, it. Erica, go ahead back and do your thing. I'm sorry. You can share your screen. And All good. Okay, I'm going to share and my screen. Please again. let me know when you want me to drop poll number two. But go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to do this. Yes. There we go. All right. Could everyone see the slides? All right. Wonderful. Yes. All right. So just like Shanae, Chanel um, talked a little bit about the Strong Black Woman, Superwoman Complex. This has been coined several years ago back in the 2000s, but probably earlier than that. It's a mantra um, in US culture that it is um, seldom realized how great a toll it has taken on emotional well being of the African American woman. As much as it may give her the illusion of control, it keeps her from identifying what she needs and reaching out for help. So that is really important when we think about our role um, because we're, we are superwoman, we are strong, we are resilient, but it's also important to make sure there's some pitfalls that come along with that that we have to be very aware of. Um, when we think about the strong black woman complex or the superwoman complex, it's usually um, based on strength and caretaking as the major tenants. It's, there's usually an increased likelihood of high and unrealistic expectations of ourselves, AKA perfectionism. Hello, have we all been there, right? Um, and then there's also an increased correlation with the depression and anxiety, which is why we are talking about that today. Of course, I'm sure all 88 of us on this phone call today can relate to the fact that we are caretakers as black women, right? We're caretakers in our communities. We are leaders. Right. We are caretakers for the whole United States. I mean, let's think about the election and those results could not have happened without black women. So we had to save our whole country. <laughs> We're saving our communities. We're saving our families. Think about how much we, we have a role in caretaking um, with our parents, our children, our nieces, our nephews. And then you think about all the things that we do in our everyday life at work in our careers in our jobs. Also, all the things that we do to volunteer, and I'm sure all of you um, do that on a daily basis. So that means it leaves little room, very little room for us to truly prioritize ourselves and take care of ourselves. And even just to stop and pause and reflect that we may need some help um, because we are going so much. It's really hard to just stop and pause. Then we add on top of that a whole pandemic, right? And that just completely exacerbates everything. And when we think about the pandemic and the burden of, of the pandemic on 
Black women especially from a financial perspective. I don't know if you know this, but the rates are, or there's data out there to suggest 30% of um, households are, the Black women is the head of the household for 30% of households. Whereas for white women, that number is about 9%. So 30%, we are responsible, we are the head of the household and 30% of all households. Then when we think about food insecurity, I don't know about you, but I cried when I saw the lines and how long they were for, you know, just getting food, you know, lines for shelters and waiting in line just to get the essentials. Then when we think about the lack of supervision, most of the jobs, most of the service jobs are actually done by Black women. So we are, we're the nurses in the hospitals, we are the doctors, we are the custodians, we are in the restaurant business, right? So we are the, we are the daycare teachers, we are the elementary school teachers, right? We're the high school teachers. So we are all there. We had a commitment to still go to work in spite of being in a whole pandemic, right? What does that mean? Their children left at home by themselves, trying to fend for themselves to, to get their own education. That means there were grandmothers and grandfathers struggling with how to take their medication, trying to remember which medications to take, because we're usually the ones reminding them to take their medication and laying it out for them, right? So you think about the lack of supervision of all of those folks at home and the impact and the burden that has on us as Black women. Then I'm sure you all are aware, rates of domestic violence increased tremendously during the pandemic. Why? Because we are no longer, some of us aren't going out and the bruises are no longer visible, right? So we're suffering in silence. And of course, that leads to more emotional abuse as well. Then we think about substance use. That has also increased. And we are struggling with increased rates of marijuana use and abuse, alcohol use and abuse, and even opiates. I know we usually think about opiate abuse as a white person problem, but it's actually impacting our Black communities and Black women right? Because we have the pain pills at home and sometimes it helps us to get it to sleep and we just need sleep, right? We need the pain to go away, whether that's emotional or physical. Then we think of the burden of the social isolation and what that meant, right? That we no longer had the ways in which we usually would connect with our sisterhood. But of course, thanks to you all, you all found a way to make that happen in 2020, which is amazing but there are a lot of women who didn't necessarily have that connection in that community. So they suffered in silence. There are changes in routine, changes in who again is the head of the household, who's bringing home the money, who's monitoring things. Routines are just thrown out the window. And of course, with the lack of routine and a lack of structure, that means there can be chaos. And when we deal with chaos, that can lead to a lot of anxiety, that can lead to inattention, that can lead to depression. We think about anticipatory anxiety, right? I think we all experience that time when we try to figure out, okay, what's next? How long are we gonna be dealing with this? I know I certainly did not think we would be in a pandemic as long as we were. I thought, okay, two, three months, our lives will be on hold, we'll be shut down, we'll be back by the end of the summer, September, everything's gonna be good and we'll be fine. But then it led to even more and more anxiety about what's to come. And of course, we as Black women are suffering, experiencing grief at higher rates as well. Why? Because Black people are more likely to get COVID. They're more likely to die from COVID, right? So we're experiencing grief from the loss of loved ones who have died from this illness, but also loss of other things, loss of our jobs and financial security, right? Loss of relationships, right? Loss, again, of that stability in the the structure that we had in our lives, that was something that we all had to grieve. Then we uh, talked a little bit about parental stress. If you had a child in, co in the midst of the COVID and you're trying to manage working full-time while being a teacher, and especially if you have a kid with special needs or disabilities, that is burdensome. And then you think about just health disparities in general and how that's impacted us as women. Because of the pandemic, guess what? People, the clinics were shut down. So the things that we normally would do, getting mammograms, getting our colonoscopies, all the like basics we were doing in terms of our prevention of health um, outcomes, negative health outcomes, we were putting all of that on hold. I have a friend who during that time didn't go to her doctor 
actually, she mentioned some concerns, but because of the backlog of patients in her hospital, she wasn't able to get her colonoscopy. Well, by the end of, well, I can't say the end of the pandemic because we're still in the pandemic, but a year into the pandemic when she finally was able to get her colonoscopy, and this is a 40-year-old friend of mine, she was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. How could that have been prevented if she were actually able to get the care she needed a year before? And of course, because she's black, because she's young, she was overlooked. They said, oh, you're 40, can't possibly be cancer. She, she wasn't taken seriously. And so many times we experience that with, within our own healthcare systems. I know doctors who have struggled with getting their mental and physical health needs met. And you would think they would be able to do it, but studies have shown it really doesn't depend on your socioeconomic status, your educational status. We as black women, we're dealing with higher rates of fertility, infertility, higher rates of um, death, you know, um, and mortality across the board in so many areas. And that takes a toll on us, you all. So how does that then reflect on our mental health? Well, here's a list of all the different psychiatric conditions that we can get. And Chanel actually made reference to depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. But there are a lot of other types of psychiatric conditions that I've seen that have really increased significantly over the course of the pandemic. However, we're going to focus on just um, depression and anxiety today. Now, you may ask, how does mental illness even develop? Well, really, it's our genetics, right? So we talked a little bit earlier about generational trauma. And I want to highlight that because generational trauma can actually change your DNA, believe it or not. There are things that we call, um, there are things like on the end of um, our DNA data that can be passed on from generation to generation to generation. So when we think about Black women, right, and the, and the Black woman complex, that existed before we ever got on a boat. For any of, you, any of you who have ever been to West Africa who have been to slave castles, you learn the other history of how women were taken from their communities, taken from you know, um, their tribes, matriarchs of the family, by the way, right? So that's passed down these, this matriarchal um, context and then placed in a dungeon where they had to survive and raped in those dungeons before they even got on a boat and were brought over to the United States. So when you think about the general generational trauma associated with that, that ends up being on a part of our DNA called a telomere, which is the end of our DNA and that gets passed down from generation to generation. So yes, we are, we are strong, we are resilient, but that trauma can sometimes come with us, right? Then there's genetics in terms of our DNA, um, if we have depressive symptoms, if we have, you know, we're talking about mental health a lot more now, but I remember, you know, asking my mom and my aunts about, you know, aunts and uncles. And it's like, Hey, what's going on? Sorry. This is my dog, Theo. And he likes to make an appearance every now and then. <laughs> um, but, you know, we didn't talk about it. And I think now we're just now starting to go back and ask our, our parents and our aunts and our uncles, Hey, what was that thing that our aunt had? You know, oh, she had schizophrenia, but nobody talked about it, right? So now we're learning, okay, we need to understand our genetics. There could be prenatal factors, family dynamics, that can be abuse, domestic violence. Um, of course, our cognitive style, our personality can play a role. And of course, environmental stressors. So when we layer on traumas that we've been through, um, she mentioned, you know, the trauma of growing up in a neighborhood where we're not safe, where there's violence every day. That takes a toll on us, but we learn how to have a callous, right, perspective because we just learn, okay, that's my environment and I can't get out of it. So I have to cope. All of that plays a role in um, the development of a psychiatric condition like depression or anxiety. So a few things just to be aware of, what does depression look like? Sure, we normally think about sadness and unhappiness, you know, being low, being depressed. And that definitely can be um, one of the ways in which depression manifests itself. But irritability is actually another way that we see it manifest. Irritability, anger, okay? Um, and when we think about depression as a clinical diagnosis, there are lots of different symptoms that can accompany those emotional feelings of rather sadness or a, a, lack, of, um, a lack of feelings. There's some people who just have a sense of apathy. They just don't care. They want to care, but they just can't. They can't care, right? So negative thinking, 
um, doubting ourselves, um, questioning ourselves, making comparisons, a lack of energy or motivation, social isolation, which again, in the midst of a pandemic, that becomes exacerbated because then you're like, well, there's no reason to go out and do anything anyways. So I might as well just sit here right by myself. And, and what we end up doing is finding the depressive symptoms just taking over our, our lives. Um, it can lead to poor attention and concentration. I, I dealt with that at my, with my work, you know, difficulties just staying on task, um, finishing notes on time, you know, and then what happens is, right, because of that superwoman complex, that high level of perfectionism that we have been taught, we have to go above and beyond what our white counterparts do in order to be successful. Well, when we start missing things or when things start falling through the cracks, where we're not performing at the level we normally perform, we start to internalize that as, oh my gosh, something's wrong with me, right? And then that can lead to, again, the whole cascade of negative thoughts. Um, attention can be, um, excuse me, appetite can be um, impacted. So poor appetite or increased appetite. You hear about binging um, disorders, binge eating disorder. I've also had individuals with, who are black, suffer from anorexia nervosa suffer from restrictive eating disorders, suffer from binge and purging disorders. So yes, eating disorders absolutely do exist in a black community. And I have to tell you, it's very rare in my practice where I don't treat a black woman who has some level of, of disordered eating associated with their primary psychiatric symptoms. And sometimes that disordered eating can then become primary right? Because then you start to lose weight and everybody's like, hey, hey girl, you're looking good. And next thing you know, those behaviors are perpetuated. Um, there can be feelings of um, worthlessness, hopelessness, and guilt. And studies have shown that in people of color, especially Black people, we send, tend to see that at higher rates in depression amongst Blacks, that sense of worthlessness, that sense of guilt, sense of shame, right? Difficulty sleeping or sleeping too much. And then of course, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, and increased substance use. One thing about um, suicidal thoughts, and somebody mentioned, you know, what is the church doing? I'm going to try to rush because I know we are running out of time. But I can tell you, um, we'll refer to this woman as Miss Kathy. Miss Kathy in my church was a woman who, she was a greeter, actually. She was a greeter. She was the first person you would see when you walk into the building and she would make you feel so welcome. You know, she would remember everything. You know, if I brought my mom to church one Sunday, how's your mom doing? You know, she would comment on the outfits. She always was dressed. So I found myself getting a lot of fashion, you know, information from her and exchanging fashion information with each other. Um, but she was just such a beautiful, loving woman. Seemed to have it all together right? She was responsible for the church bulletin. She was one of the biggest leaders. She made sure that we honored our pastor and our first lady. And guess what? During this pandemic, we didn't realize as a church that she was suffering in silence. And it wasn't until her completed suicide that we realized she had been dealing with it on her own. So yes, as a church, we have to talk about this, we have to prioritize it because black women are dying daily from this illness. So transitioning to anxiety symptoms, perfectionism, I talked about that, we internalize that from children. I remember myself thinking, okay, I have to be the best in my class because I'm the only little black girl in this whole white class. So that means I need to do well. And that carried on throughout my career, the Spelman, and then eventually I went and got my medical degree at Duke, that a place like Duke, you needed to bring it, you needed to be on. But that perfectionism can sometimes lead to high levels of anxiety. That looks like generalized worry, worries about what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, catastrophic thinking. It can lead to avoidance, right? That can mirror social isolation. We may avoid going out into crowds. We may avoid speaking up. Right, it's already hard. I think sometimes to speak up as Black women when we're we're told that our voice and our ma doesn't matter, right? But if you're dealing with social anxiety, where there's a fear of how you're being perceived and worries about being judged or being looked down upon, then it can lead to symptoms of avoidance, irritability. Again, that we see that in depression, but we can also see that in anxiety, somatic symptoms. So as Black women, this is important. 
stomach aches, headaches, even heart pain, chest pain. Sometimes we feel a heaviness in our chest. It's like, where is this coming from? Yes, we want to make sure we're not dealing with any kind of cardiac issues. But oftentimes I'm seeing it's anxiety. We are carrying so much anxiety. It manifests itself physically to the point where we're having heart problems, maybe panic symptoms, hairs falling out, right? Those are all the effects of high cortisol, the stress hormone that's carried throughout our body. And when we carry that, we're not doing anything with that. Our body, it will take a toll on us. It will eat us up. So again, changes in habits, eating habits, a need to control things, right? We got our hands and everything, right? Because it's like, nope, if we don't control every little detail, then everything's going to fall apart without us. So we find ourselves micromanaging everyone, our children, our our puppies, our parents, <laughs> you know, our significant others, right? Um, and that is a lot. Analysis paralysis. So that's when we overanalyze to the point where we can't even move. We can't even think about next steps because we are in a state of overanalyzing everything. And of course, when we're dealing with high levels of anxiety, like I mentioned, it can lead to increased substance use. It can lead to sleep disturbances. It can take a toll on our health. It can even lead to panic attacks where you feel like you cannot move because you're so overwhelmed with anxiety. So when we think about, okay, why as women are we not seeking resources? I think there is a movement. I will say I'm seeing more and more referrals from Black women, Black men, Black parents. So I, I do treat a, a large chunk of, um, of my practice is treating Black women. So I do think we are starting to access those resources, but I think there are a lot of barriers, fear, shame, stigma. Right now, especially in the midst of this whole COVID thing, there's a mistrust, right? In terms of our medical resources and community, we don't trust our doctors. We don't trust the therapists. What are they going to say? Is this going to follow me? Is my job, I can't tell you how many people ask me, is my job going to get these records? Are they going to find out? There's so much fear about being stigmatized. Our religion and spirituality, I have literally heard a pastor say that if they're dealing with depression and suicidality, that they have the devil in them and they need to pray for that devil to come out. And I walked up out that church because I was like, I can't support this. So unfortunately that is still being perpetuated, but I am seeing a movement with churches, fortunately, where they are opening up to talking about mental health in the black community, especially. But again, barriers to treatment, racism, you know, finances, we are underinsured, right? We are, we are more likely to not have insurance or to be underinsured as black women. Um, we think about resources. Well, if I need a 60 day treatment for substance use, how am I, who's gonna take care of my kid? Who's gonna work if I'm the primary breadwinner? So if I need detox for my alcohol, disorder, how am I going to get treatment when I have to take care of responsibilities at home, right? And then you think about clinician bias. Again, we, we are overlooked because of the way clinicians sometimes see us and overlook us. And that's why it's so important to identify Black therapists, Black doctors for not only therapy, but also sometimes medication management is necessary. So there is hope. We just have to recognize those symptoms early. We have to become advocates, which I'm sure all of you are, we have to seek help, break the stigma. Sharing our story helps to break stigma and also just have hope. And here are just some resources for you all. Um, I love Therapy for Black Girls. I love the Loveland Foundation, Psychology Today. You can stratify any of those resources according to race, according to LGBTQ status, according to religion, according to insurance is accepted. So please take note of those resources. And I know I went over time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Giraz. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a burning question for Dr. Giraz? I saw something in the chat I thought was interesting from Linda, Linda Carter. Um, meant to, I think she wanted to see what the rates of suicide were before or after affirmative action. I thought that was an interesting point. Exactly. In Let me tell you. Ahead, I, I actually, I did ask a question and I did because there are certain opportunities that we've had after affirmative action that we didn't have, like women in the workplace in the degrees that we are in, wait a minute, I'm trying to get it. To the degree that we have opportunities that we didn't have before, 
mm. affirmative action. Mm. And so, you know, the rate of suicide, we didn't have the same pressures on us. Mm -hmm. It may be financial pressures, but it wasn't trying to keep up with people at the job. Mm. So mm -hmm. when I talk about affirmative action, you know, that's like the benchmark for me. When we didn't have those opportunities, we weren't in those spaces versus when we're, we have those opportunities and we're in those spaces in large numbers. So in terms of suicide, because I, I, you know, it was anecdotal, but I didn't know anybody. And then I think about people who came from, as you said earlier, who come from the situations prior to being kidnapped. And, you know, I know people commit suicide on those boats to keep from getting there, but their purpose for committing suicide was a little different. So if you could speak a little bit to, you know, to the best of your knowledge about the differences in terms of where we are, you know, um, let me just say, I'm trying to clarify it in terms of from the kidnapping stage, really to getting here up to affirmative action, then after affirmative action. And, and before and before she answers, I'm going to let you know I'm dropping question number two. So you have 60 seconds to answer that while the doctor's speaking. Um, go ahead. Um, that's a great question, Linda. And I really just have to say, I don't know. I've never been asked that in terms of affirmative action. You know, I know the rates have been steadily increasing amongst American society, you know, over the years and particularly, particularly amongst Blacks, but especially Black youth. Um, over the last like 10 years, if you look at those trends, Black youth and Black boys, especially. So Black girls are more likely to attempt black boys are more likely to be successful. And I, I think, I can't help but to think that's because of the images that they see of black men being shot to death and killed and internalizing that, that they have no sense of, of worth, right? I could tell you just, I mean, this isn't research-based, but I'm just thinking in terms of what schools look like before affirmative action and after having come from an HBCU and to know what it looks like to be in a setting where everybody is rooting for you, that mm -hmm. your teachers, your professors, they want you to be successful. They see the best in you. They do hold high expectations. Like I had some of my hardest professors were from Spelman, <laughs> but it's because they have high expectations, but they give you the support to meet them, right? And when you think about schools now, I'm working with um, some, actually it's a brother and sister. Their mom is a nurse, right? So imagine she's working in COVID, working even more hours than ever before. Her kids have been at home and she didn't find out until the end of the year, they're both failing. Why are they failing? They were A students, super smart. And the teachers, nobody let the parent know that they were struggling. She's just assuming they're doing fine. And they weren't. Why? It's because I think they didn't necessarily expect them to do great, right? So those expectations are different. And then if you don't, again, if you don't have that support, if you don't have that handholding, then you get missed in school, right? You think about, so it starts at a young age um, where, you know, we are seeing black youth being more likely to go through detention than to be treated for ADHD, for instance, you know? So I know we're, just, we're talking about black women. I'm also a child psychiatrist. I understand. <laughs> And this was another question. I'll just real quick. Um, you know, I grew up where we were in black capitalism because nobody wanted our money. Affirmative action opened the doors for other people to want our money. So when I, I had put a question in earlier, what impact has our, our embracing the capitalism outside of our community had on black women's health? Yeah, that's a good question. And I mean, th again, this is all based on my opinion, not necessarily based off research. I would love to see if anyone has actually even researched that, but, but because it's a great question. Um, I can imagine, yes, with capitalism, there's more being stripped from our community, right? And when you think about Black women, um, we are more likely to be business owners in our community, right? So if you think about all the Black women who are business owners, think about capitalism and how that affects us, how we're not able to get loans from banks, right? That can, that can take a toll on our mental health. Then you think about COVID and how, you know, we see big businesses thriving. Some small businesses do, but there are a lot of Black women-owned businesses that, that had to shut down in the midst of COVID, right? So of course, 
you know, you're thinking about the financial implications of that. Again, the internalization of that, the fear, the anxiety, how do I provide for my family? I mean, I would think that would absolutely lead to higher rates of anxiety and depression. But again, I don't have any data to confirm that, but it, it makes sense. <laughs> I'm going, to, um, I'm going to share the results of the poll and you can address them, Dr. Jazara, Jazira. Did I miss Rasa. Rasa. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Okay. If you were having a mental health challenge, would you be comfortable seeking help? And it sounds like 86% of you would feel comfortable seeking help, but there is a small set subset of you who wouldn't. And I guess it's hard because, you know, we don't have any ways to um, put it in the chat without it being, you know, confidential. But I wonder, you know, my question is, okay, what are, what are the barriers that get in the way to seeking out help? Is it because we don't know how? Is it because we just are, we're, we are fearful that it's not going to work? You know, is it because of our previous negative experiences with the med within the medical community and the historic context? Um, is it financial? You know, so I, definitely a lot of questions I have about that. But I'm glad to see the majority of us would. And the, the reality is there are resources out there for us as Black women. There's a whole host. I love therapy for Black girls. A lot of doctors and therapists are under that platform. And it's been amazing. It's been amazing. I get a lot of referrals from them myself. Um, I've had to seek out because as a psychiatrist, I was starting to feel the pressure, right, of owning a business and having to transition all of a sudden to telemedicine and the fear of not knowing whether or not people would want to do that, especially kids. And dealing with that, dealing with family issues, dealing with health issues in the family, um, trying to manage that. While again, my friend is like being diagnosed with colon cancer. I had another friend who died of leukemia during this time. So I found myself giving, 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 giving to all of my patients. And at one point I was like, I'm, I'm about to crack. <laughs> I'm not, I can, this is not sustainable. This is no longer sustainable. And if I'm being an advocate for mental health, you know, and telling everybody why they need to seek out resources, I need to seek out my own resource. And I'll tell you, it was hard. I did not expect it to be that hard as a psychiatrist to find a black therapist who was taking patients, you know, taking people. I was put on two wait lists. I never got a call back off the wait list, you know, and I was like, y'all, I'm, I'm a mental health provider. Can somebody take me? <laughs> awesome. yeah, I will tell you, since I've been doing that, it has helped so much because she's like, yeah, you can't carry this all on your own. Why do you think you can? And we carry it because we just, we always have, right? But we don't have to. We don't have to. There are, there are resources available. Y'all, this chat is amazing. I'm trying to keep up with the chat. The chat. Now, the, the chat. We've, been, we've loved this conversation with you, Dr. Duraza. We might have to have you come back. So I just want to share a little early that we do have three more sessions about uh, mental health. Um, and I'm going to say them real briefly. The next one will be on bipolarism, schizophrenia, and suicide. Um, the one after that is the police and their responses to the Black communities when there's a mental health um issue going on a concern and then mental health for children teens adults and seniors so that's what we plan to have I, I know I shared this a little earlier but just in case some people get off the phone I wanted to know people to know that we do plan to cover these areas and any other suggestions you want to hear please put them in the chat and now I'm going to turn the mic over to Kelthia you're muted Kelthia you're muted Thank you, Dr. Well, thank you for telling me. <laughs> and we'll have you on for questions after this. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Erica. That was wonderful. A great overview of mental health in the Black community. And now we're going to move on to Shanae Frazier Awika, I believe. Um, that's her last name. And um, I hope I'm saying it correctly. And uh, Michelle, could you highlight, can you spotlight um, Shanae? Um, Shanae Frazier um, is the Northern New Jersey Regional Coordinator for NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness um, and their Act Now initiative. Um, it's a multicultural outreach group for African-Americans and, and she's the NAMI signature, 
and um, she's a part of the NAMI, NAMI Signature Program, In Our Own Voices, Outreach and Programming for mental, about Mental Health and the Black Community. And so please welcome Shanae. Shanae, you're muted, so take yourself off a of mute. And, um, and we will turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Okay. Happy to be here. Good afternoon, ladies. Um, yeah, that chat was popping. So um, I was trying to keep up with it too. <laughs> I'm going to answer the poll real quick. All right, I'm back. So um, happy to be here. I am coming to you from Newark, New Jersey, Brick City, what up? And I wanna talk to you ladies today about what my lived experience as a black woman with mental health has, with a mental health ex condition has been. Um, I know that today's topic is depression and anxiety, but I will um, start off by saying that my, dis my diagnosis is actually bipolar disorder which um, has tenants of depression and hypomania. So mostly I'll be talking about the depressive episodes that have come with it. Um, and I'd say that my journey started a long time ago, back when I was younger, I think my family always knew something was off. And I say that half jokingly, I have a twin sister and um, growing up people are always like, oh, there's the nice one and then there's the, the other one. Now, not to say that I wasn't nice, but I used to have these crazy mood swings and nobody knew what to talk about, um, what to do for me when I would have those mood swings. They, I, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Um, as I got older, I believe my parents thought it was just teenage hormones or what will you. Um, I grew up in the Philly area, shout out to the 215. And I was a family that was very religious. We were in church pretty much all the times the doors were open. And one of the things that I noticed quickly was that mental health resources weren't necessarily something that was brought up in my home. Um, and that isn't you because your phone? my family didn't believe in it. I believe they just didn't know about it. My mother's response to everything was- you got me right week. back. Oh, sorry, somebody else talking? Yeah, I'm trying to see who it is. Sorry about that. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my mother was someone that was always of the idea, well, let's talk to sister so-and-so. Let's go pray with pastor. It was never, let's go see a therapist or let's talk to a doctor and see why you're feeling the way you do. Um, and the reason why I brought up that I grew up in the Philly area is because since moving to New Jersey, one of the big things that I've learned is the difference between the two states is that there's no school social workers in Pennsylvania. That's not a thing. Whereas it's very much a presence in the state of New Jersey. And I bring that up because if there had been a school social worker present in my school, perhaps I wouldn't have fallen through the cracks the way I did. Um, I was an above average student. I was involved. I you know, held down a part-time job. I was active in community service. I checked all the boxes. Um, oh, thanks for letting me know, Annette. Um, there weren't any in my school, I, I'll correct myself. Um, the other things that were a problem were because I came from a family where my mother was involved in my education, nobody thought to ask, why is she having all these issues, these mood swings? I was never in class. I was always in the guidance counselor's office, et cetera, et cetera. So finally they said, you know what, you have to go to the school psychologist who also wasn't someone that was part of the school staff. It was someone that came from a local private practice a few days a week. So I don't know what I would have done if I had had some sort of breakdown in school on a day that the school psychologist wasn't in the building. Um, that being said, when I got to college, it was more of the same. I went to Seton Hall University. Um, and when I was there, I noticed that my um, depression was just getting worse. Now, at first I thought, oh, I'm just sad because I'm separated from my twin sister. That's never been the case before. And I'm an hour from where I grew up. But I noticed that as I got more comfortable and made more friends on campus, I still had those depressive symptoms dogging me all four years. I would go to the services on campus and I would have a few sessions, but when they started talking medicine, I was out. And the reason why is because I didn't have a lot of information and knowledge about psychiatric medications when I was younger. 
And I was under the impression that taking them would make me feel like a zombie. A lot of people, they'll talk about mental health and therapy, but people get funny when you start talking about medication for it. And that was the boat that I was in. A lot of people said, oh, you don't need that. That stuff makes you crazy. It'll make you have no emotions. You'll be mute. You're not going to be yourself. And I internalized a lot of that information. And I didn't know that there was another way, that there was a lot of different options out there. I started taking medication in 2013. But like I said, I wasn't very well educated on psychiatric medication. So I'm sitting here taking it like it's vitamins, thinking that it's just going to work because I took it, not realizing that I should have been checking in with the doctor, taking note of my moods, all of that. And I wasn't doing that. And finally, someone close to me said, hey, are you taking care of yourself the way you're supposed to? Are you taking your medications? Are you compliant with them? And I said, yes, I am. And they were like, oh, I think you need to get a second opinion because you've been off. And this is where I was going to say the uh, slideshow that Dr. Erica shared, I felt like she might have talked to my care team because a lot of the symptoms that she had listed on there were things that I was exhibiting, whether I realized it or not. And once that happened, um, this person said to me, I think you need to go get a second opinion. So I went to a new psychiatrist in 2017, four years after I started taking medication. So um, I like to say that I actually started recovery in 2017 because that's when I went to a psychiatrist that really helped me get to the root of my problem. And the root, honestly speaking, was that I had been misdiagnosed for years. Um, I had been being treated for major depressive disorder and it turned out that I had bipolar disorder which meant that my mood swings weren't being addressed, but my depression was. And once I started to get on a medication regimen that made sense for my new diagnosis, things did start to look up. Now, I wasn't well educated on bipolar disorder because I thought I had something else for years. And the turning point for me came in 2018. Um, so prior to the pandemic, um, in August, I got married to a very handsome Nigerian man. And then a week later, I started graduate school. That was a mistake. <laughs> I didn't realize that um, even when you have some life events happening that are very positive, they can still take a, a serious toll on your psych. And as a result, um, I ended up in the psych ward of the local hospital. Um, and I was there for almost a week. And once I came out, I, I honestly, the, the hospital stay wasn't what helped me. If I'm being honest, it was the program that I did when I came out of the hospital that I felt really was where I got the help that I needed and started to ground myself and learn some real coping tools and how to get myself back on track with managing the illness. Um, I did notice some patterns over the years, such as, um, the fact that I always had more depressive symptoms in the fall going into winter, seasonal affective disorder. Um, and once I learned that, I started to take closer note of my moods, um, even to the point of tracking them in a journal, um, being conscious of the medication during that time. And at one point even asked to up one of the medications so I could stay on track. And honestly, one of the things that I have learned on my journey is that it's not linear. Um, there are some peaks and there are some valleys and that's just the name of the game. There's never going to be a smooth path with it long-term. Um, I'll have setbacks with it, but the important thing is that now I have a support system and I have tools in place. Um, I definitely am not someone that, now I believe that everybody's path with it is different. For me personally, medication and therapy is the name of the game. Um, I, I can't see doing one without the other. I need both to stay stable. And I'm blessed that I'm with a therapist who is a phenomenal Black woman that really keeps me on track. And she's helped me so much since I got serious about my recovery. But um, one of the things that people don't like to talk about is, at least for me, it used to be difficult for me to talk about it um, in church because I noticed that a lot of people kind of shied away from those kind of conversations, but I'm thankful to belong to a church where my pastor is actually a retired medical doctor. 
And I remember when I first joined the church, I was very honest with him about my situation. And he said, look, like, I want to see you at Bible study, but don't skip your appointments with your doctor, get your medication. Um, and that was encouraging to me because I had been in so many religious spaces where I wasn't allowed to be free with the mental health condition. I actually spent a lot of time thinking I was a bad Christian, that I had a bad testimony, that I wasn't representing the kingdom properly because I was walking around with these depressive thoughts. And, you know, Christians are supposed to be full of joy because we have the spirit of the Lord in us and what was wrong with me. And I just had to get a handle on the fact that, um, oh, thank you for asking that, Miss Higgy. Um, it absolutely did. My husband, um, like I mentioned, is a Nigerian immigrant. And also want to shout out, he just got his green card um, within the past two weeks. So we've been very happy over here. Um, it was a culture shock, um, our marriage, um, getting used to the way his culture addresses mental health versus the way we do in America. Um, and our marriage, definitely, we had to learn some things. I had learned to be more open with him about how I was feeling. I went so long living with my twin sister who is a therapist herself and was used to my moods, my expressions. We know each other like the back of our hands. And I was so used to somebody being there that just knew and got it. Now, when my husband and I got married and he moved in, I just expected him to know, but that wasn't realistic. And I had to learn more about myself and about the illness so that I could show him certain things that he could be doing and I also had to learn to have better boundaries about his mental health um, because I realized bipolar and some of the other mood disorders are very selfish illnesses. You spend a lot of time inside your own head fixating and ruminating on your own issues that sometimes you don't see what's going on in the world and with the people you love around you. And I had to learn to become more aware of being respectful of other people's mental health. So once I gained that awareness, um, it's really been eye-opening for me, not just with my husband, who um, has been an absolute rock during this process, but other people around me um, that have, um, I've realized have some mental health things going on. I've been able to be an encouragement to them because I've been able to see where I can step back and then also when it's appropriate to step forward and say, hey, I, I noticed you know, you're a little off lately. Like, you wanna talk about it? Can you come to a support group with me? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There's a lot of different resources out there, and I recognize that everybody is not like me, ready to jump into therapy and seeing a doctor. Um, but I always say I can be a listening ear, I can be a supportive ear, a listening friend. I whatever you need, um, you know. If you want to start off with a support group, you can turn your video off. You don't even have to share. Just maybe hearing other people's stories will inspire you. Something will spark within you. Maybe it's time that I see about getting help for myself, or maybe you have a loved one that you've noticed some behaviors in and you're worried about them, but you don't know where to start with helping them. Um, it is a tricky topic and it's, it's sensitive and it's scary to approach people about it. Um, but one of the things that I've learned is that people will thank you. They will absolutely be appreciative of you coming to them and saying, hey, like, I care about you. I just wanna know, like, are you good? I know I had somebody do that for me and it made a world of difference. Um, and it wasn't, they weren't coming to me in a clinical capacity. They were just coming because they cared. And sometimes that's really all we need. We don't need to know all the terminology and the clinical terms and you know necessarily all the resources. They just need to know that we care. Because honestly, a lot of people that are struggling with depression and anxiety, the biggest thing that we deal with is not thinking that anybody cares feeling like we're a burden, the world might be better off without us, we don't have anything to offer to people. Those kind of thoughts are a huge, huge burden. But knowing that just one person cares makes all the difference. It sounds so cliche, but I promise you that in my own life, that has been the case. Very good. And Thank you so much, Shanae. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us. We really appreciate it so much. I'm just wondering if you, well, you mentioned that you think you may have seasonal affective disorder, I guess, you know, that you're affected by the seasons. Yes, every year around um, late 
October, early November, here it comes with the extra depressive episodes to mm -hmm. the point where um, two years ago, my psychiatrist up my antidepressants for me in response to that. Um, and tweaking the medication made a huge difference for me. Um, but I also, like I said, I'm mindful of my own moods around that time of year. Um, invested in a light therapy box that I got off Amazon for a pretty decent price. And um, that's helpful as well. But one of the biggest things that I've learned is just to stay on top of the, um, you know, the, the light, the lack of light that we get to vitamin D is part of the issue. I, you know, I've done my research on this. Um, no, we're near an expert, but that means that on the days when there is a little bit of sun peeking through, I try to get out there and go for a walk, even if it's for five minutes, just so I can get some scent, some sunlight, some fresh air. It does a wealth of good for my um, mood. Great, great. That's That was what I was wondering. So you said you have the light box. I was wondering if you did any kind of alternative therapy. Um, also, could you just say a little bit about NAMI and if you have been a participant there, how it helped you and then what you do there in terms of the community? Absolutely. Um, I am the Northern Regional Coordinator for NAMI New Jersey, which means that for all of the Northern counties, um, I do programming, um, speak at events. If there, I'm trying to get support groups going in different churches and different community centers. Um, and in addition to that, I lead a support group for other people that have mental health conditions. Uh, it's not limited to any one condition, um, anyone that feels comfortable to come and share with us is open to it. And because everything is online now with Zoom, it, it, you know, mine says North Jersey, but really you can be anywhere in the US and come. Um, I had a friend from California join us one time. Um, I was thankful that he was willing to let go of the time difference to join us. But um, in addition to that, um, the other program that I do with NAMI is called In Our Own Voices. And it essentially is two people with lived experience that are sharing their story in like three segments. And they are what happened, what helps, and what's next. Um, and these are people that are, are fairly stable in their recovery plan that are able to talk about it with, um, you know, without having like any sort of breakdown or anything. Like these are people that have didn't just get out of the psych ward basically, that have been stable for a little while, able to share their story, um, able to tell you what they do for treatment, whether it be therapy or um, medication. Some people do yoga. I know some people have tapped into art therapy, different things like that. Um, for me, I actually do um, kickboxing. <laughs> it's a great way to relieve stress and also get those endorphins flowing. Um, and plus like you learn a couple of self-defense moves in the process. So it's pretty good for me punching those bags. <laughs> That is great. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you both ladies. Um, Miss Higgy, I guess I see this, you're sharing with us the results of the last um, question. Um, do you want to go over? The okay. question is, go ahead, Miss Higgy. Oh, do it. Your thing. Um, do strong Black women seek mental health therapy? That's the question. And 74% of the respondents said, yes, and 26% uh, said no. Um, and there were a total of 68 people who responded. Um, so that's the, um, if you all wanna give some feedback about your thoughts on that, um, do strong black women seek mental health therapy? And um, Ms. Higgy, I guess you can get ready to drop the third question and, um, and then I, I, we'll- I that was the third question. We did all three now. So that was the third question. Thank you. Okay. Then um, we're ready for Q&A. Ms. Higgy, if you want to take that. Oh, out. hey. Um, I'm just, uh, yeah, I thought it was a, first of all, thank you all for coming. It was uh, for our guests. You guys did, a, you ladies did a wonderful job. Um, you know, um, I think that there was a lot of activity in the chat, which is always a good sign that people are getting good information. So I'm just gonna open it up to questions. Um, if you have a question, please raise your electronic hand and we will call on you. Um, I will start out just by talking about, um, you know, the stigmas that come with therapy. And thank you so much, 
um, Shanae for sharing because I think that's a big stigma. We don't want to talk about it. And we do believe that we're super women. And yeah, we some hell of five women, but we're women. And I think that we have to be very careful because when we want others to to see us as human and feminine and what have we, we need to allow that to happen, right? And, and if we can even talk a little bit, even though we're not going to get into the weeds on it, like what's happening this week with the whole Jada Smith thing and, you know, Black men showing up for Black women. There's so much that we can talk about, right? And um, so I'm just going to turn it over to you. Um, all I see that there's a hand up, so we'll go to Miss Latrice. Did you want to pose your question on screen? Or are you good off screen? I'm good off screen. It's not necessarily a question, but it's for Dr. Diazza. I said it wrong. That's okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to touch on when you mentioned how, like, for me, I just learned, like, I've been having heart problems. I had a surgery last year and then surgery again this year, but I had to get clearance because of my heart. And I'm like, okay, I was never told I had heart problems. What's, what's going on with my heart? So um, the EKG reads that I had a heart attack if you read the EKG. So they asked me all these questions like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm like, I never had a heart attack. I don't know, whatever, whatever. So then in November, I had an asthma attack. They kept me in the hospital because I had sign of tachycardia. And I'm like, they were like, have anybody told you that you have something wrong with your heart? And I'm like, but I've been... I keep going to the doctor. I'm getting it checked because, you know, I can't get approved for my surgery. So recently I just had surgery again this Monday and I had to get a echo and then I had to get a stress test because they saying that I have something wrong in my heart. The EKG is beating the same as it read last year. Come find out the doctor just basically saying he thinks it's anxiety. He did the whole check. I passed everything, but he thinks that I have tachycardia because I'm suffering from anxiety. When once a couple of years ago, I was on anxiety medicine, I stopped taking it because mm -hmm. I just felt like I don't want to be on medication. Medication works for some people. It doesn't work for all. And for me, I decided my best thing was not to be on it, not realizing that it was now it's starting to affect me physically because I'm not taking care of myself mentally. But no one has never taken that and put it together and explained it to me till recently with all these tests happening that my anxiety is, is causing me heart problems, where it's affecting me having surgery. And I'm just like, wow. So he just was basically, the cardiologist like, you need to work on getting your anxiety together because it messes, is messing with your heart. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Thank you guys. Well, Ms. Patrice, like, thank you. Man. Yes. Wow, Miss Latrice, thank you so much for sharing your story. Sh Shanae, thank you for sharing your story. I think if there are physical symptoms that you're noticing in your body, always take those seriously. I think sometimes as Black women, we can overlook things like, ah, oh, no, that ain't nothing. Because why? We have too many other things to do. We don't have time to go to the doctor. <laughs> we don't have time to check it up. So, you know, whether that's heart stuff, GI distress, you know, I can't tell you how many people I know are dealing with GI distress and then they see a, a gastroenterologist and the gastroenterologist is like, I think this is anxiety related. So it sounds like you did the right thing and that you sought out the medical, you know, you had them rule out any kind of medical concerns for the heart, um, the tachycardia that you were experiencing, which you got your echo, you got the stress test, saw the cardiologist. Um, but you're right. Sometimes, you know, we are dealing with anxiety and it manifests through heart palpitations, you know, manifests as chest tightness or pain. And we want to do the medical evaluation workup, but we also, if it comes down to it that everything's medically normal and it may be anxiety, then we have to start thinking, okay, what could be going on? Am, am I dealing with stress? I'm just not acknowledging, you know, am I trying to manage too much? What am I worried about? Do I need to seek out, you know, a therapist or a psychiatrist to better understand what's happening with this anxiety who can then give you treatments, you know, which there are lots of different kinds of therapy for anxiety. And there are some instances where medications may be necessary to really help bring down anxiety to a more tolerable level to the point where you can engage in some of the coping mechanisms and therapy. So it could, it could be very complex, but I really appreciate that comment and for you sharing. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask, I was talking to someone the other day and um, I, I don't even know who, I, maybe the ladies as we were planning for this. And I said that when my mother 
was um, a young woman who died at 45. So, and she's been dead for 30 years. So we're talking back in the seventies. I just remember her and all of her friends were on nerve pills. <laughs> what do you think that, I mean, like, so we were saying, I wonder what the prescription really was. I mean, how many people on here remember your parents? I mean, my mom, your, your mom talking about nerve pills. So Dr. Erica, what do you think the nerve pill was that they were just giving to black women as they were also giving us hysterectomies? But that's a whole nother. Gosh, well, that's a whole nother conversation. But I think maybe at the time it's possible they were giving out. I think back in the day when benzodiazepines were first developed along with opiates, you know, people were given opiates for pain, any kind of pain. It's like, all right, let's give you an opiate. And that was before the medical community knew how potentially habit forming opiates were. And I think the same thing happened with a subset of medications called benzodiazepines. So that's your Ativan, your Clonopin, um, Valium. You may have heard of some of those medications that can be really helpful in treating acute anxiety, but they can sometimes be habit forming. So as a profession, we, we have tended to kind of pull away from just throwing those out to anyone who's dealing with anxiety. I know in my practice, I much rather would say, okay, let's give you some coping skills, mindfulness practices, y'all. We didn't really talk about mindfulness, but that is a great way to deal with anxiety. There are a lot of free uh, resources. There's a lot of content out there for, um, you know, just learning how to do guided meditations, deep breathing, all sorts of breathing techniques. Um, but sometimes those things are just not enough. And if you need further treatment for an anxiety disorder, the first thing they shouldn't throw out is a benzodiazepine. Again, it's usually reserved for really bad panic disorder. Um, but Oftentimes, antidepressants may be used for anxiety. Um, that's usually the first line of treatment. Medications like Zoloft or Prozac or Selexa. Yeah. Lexa. Yeah, I, was just, uh, I hadn't thought of that in a long time. Let me say also, I see that Chanel is still with us. I'm thinking maybe she's by phone. But um, so if you have a question for Chanel, I'm assuming that she's available to answer it. That was our first speaker. So thank you, Dr. Erica. Uh, here's yes, your I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in transition, so I can speak, but I'm not able to turn my camera on at the moment. Okay, fine. So if you all have a question for her, she's still here. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. I appreciate that. Um, and here is your Spellman sister, Miss Jennifer McVeer, who has, <laughs> who has a question for you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank, oh Lord, I gotta go. I'll be back. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. okay. Don't, don't leave us, just come back. Okay, um, so um, Donna McRae, you're next. Donna. Hi, uh, I ran across and I probably messed it up putting in the chat, but I ran across an article and it caught my attention because um, I do have a little bout of uh, depression and I found that um, exercise works for me. Um, I uh, engage in exercise three or four times a week. During the pandemic, I started walking the neighborhood um, because the, the Y, the gym, all of them were closed. But um, yoga helps. Um, it, it just, it just I, when I'm outside, I'm just so grateful for the fresh air, the trees, the flowers. I thank God for all the different varieties that we have and how wonderful he is to uh, let us enjoy those things and it, exercise is just um, so wonderful. I've never been on medication and but I wanted to ask the doctor about uh, women in general in reference to menopause and how that has affected uh, us as women and um, you know they used to say uh, women would go crazy when they would be in the menopause stage I don't know if I went crazy, but I'm sure that my husband and kids saw some change in me during those uh, those years. But um, I, I'm a big advocate of exercise. Thank and can you. I piggyback on that, Dr. Erica? I have a student who is about to do a presentation for us, black female student who has postpartum and her family just will not accept that she has postpartum. So I, I'm piggybacking onto the menopause part of that. If you can. Yes, absolutely. You know, so when we think about 
the manifestation of mood symptoms, whether that's depressive symptoms, irritability. Shanae made reference to bipolar disorder, which is characterized by episodes of what we call either hypomania or manic-like behaviors. Um, we can see that with hormone changes, right? That's why as, as when you compare boys and girls before the onset of puberty, the rates of depression are about equal, but then as soon as puberty hits, poof, rates of depression um, skyrocket in women at that time. So I think um, it's very common to see with any kind of hormonal shifts, whether that's the onset of puberty, whether that's postpartum, whether that is menopause, whether that's even starting certain kinds of oral contraceptives, there can definitely be changes in mood regulation. So I always tell folks to try to make note, take notes of your mood, you know, take notes of the energy levels, what you're feeling, you know, if you're irritable or angry, you know, if you're sleeping or not, appetite, things like that, because that definitely can correlate with any kind of change in hormonal status. And if you are noticing those changes, then it's really important to get your gynecologist or your OBGYN involved because they can definitely help. Um, so sometimes we think we don't think that these things overlap, but you are. Our body is one body, right? Our brain is an organ just like every other organ, and they're all interconnected, right? So you can see how one might impact the other. Um, thyroid, that could be another thing that could be, I think I put that in the chat, but I see that a lot where people may have hypothyroid or hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can mimic a manic episode, whereas hypothyroidism can mimic a depressive episode. So it's really important that we are also prioritizing our physical health and making sure if we're noticing any shifts and changes along with our physical symptoms, we want to make sure we're documenting that, keeping good notes, and then sharing that with our medical provider. And I love the exercise thing. I she read in my bio, I'm a yoga instructor, I'm a cycling instructor. I love lifting heavy things. I love jump roping. That's something I picked up in the pandemic since I couldn't go to a gym, I couldn't do the yoga. So I ended up taking it back to like age 10 and I just got a jump rope and I started jump roping. <laughs> um, whatever the body movement is, make sure you have fun. Engage, you know, it doesn't have to be the typical, oh, I need to work out. Do something that you enjoy doing, whether that's going for a walk, playing tennis, you know, playing golf, whatever that may be, you know, just get your body moving. It could be having your own dance party, you know, put on a little James Brown for 30 minutes and have your own dance party. There you go. You got your body movement. So have fun with it. Or you can join Miss Shanae for kickboxing. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I wanted to um, mention that. So I know that, um, it, so for people that know me personally, kickboxing doesn't seem like this type of exercise that I would normally do. I'm very girly. I'm always in skirts and dresses. I don't like to wear pants. I'm always like, you know, very, let's do this, let's do that. But when it comes to the exercise, I realized that kickboxing um, worked for me in a number of ways. Um, number one, one of the things that it's interesting that Dr. Erica brought this up in her slideshow, um, one of the um, I guess we'll say precursors to a lot of mood disorders is trauma. And for me, I was sexually abused for a number of years when I was younger, which led to a lot of the manifestation of my later depressive symptoms and some of my manic episodes. And one of the things that I learned in therapy was to deal with trauma was kind of taking back my own body, if you will, taking back power. And that was what drew me to kickboxing. Like I, I mentioned earlier, in addition to being a good workout, I learned some self-defense moves while I was at it. And it kind of gave me back a power that I, I had struggled with owning. And um, that was one of the things that um, I find to be, you know, because yoga, I, I've tried it, doesn't always work for me. I feel like I can't get my head centered to do it. Um, I've tried other exercise methods and some work, some don't, but I always found when I got into that kickboxing room, kicking and punching seemed to do the trick for me. So um, I definitely like exercise is something that I use as a mental health. <laughs> oh, I have another kickboxer out there. Uh, um, I definitely do that because it, oh. it, it's like a, a mind body. It, it's the whole package for me. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to mention is that um, 
one of the reasons why I started sharing my story was because I realized, especially when I'm in rooms with um, other Black women, I have yet to have a presentation where someone didn't come up to me afterwards and say that they didn't, that they knew someone or they personally went through the same thing I did when referring to the sexual abuse. And the truth, I've done some, you know, studying on this. Um, by the time we're 18, I believe one in five women will have been sexually assaulted, um, Black women. So when I first started telling my story, I used to feel so isolated and alone. And I used to wonder, like, are people really going to understand where I'm coming from and what I'm saying? Um, but the thing is that there's a lot of people that are suffering from that too. And unfortunately, it's not a, a topic that we're always comfortable sharing. Um, you know, I've worked through my personal trauma, so I've gotten to a place in my journey where I can share, but I know for other people, they're not necessarily there yet, but I just want to put it out there that, um, you know, continue to work through whatever your, your particular issues are. It's worth it when you get to the other side and you start having those breakthroughs. Um, someone had asked in the chat, I think it was you, Miss Higgy, about did my marriage survive? And the, the truth is, um, my sexual abuse was more of a deterrent than anything else because I, what I realized was that I approached men and sex kind of like negatives. I didn't realize that I was doing that. And it came, my therapist used to constantly say to me, it's, it's trauma reaction, it's trauma reaction. I couldn't understand why I was saying and doing some of the things that I was doing. And she just was like, you got to work on the trauma piece of you. I was so toxic towards men. I had an apathetic uh, attitude towards sex and sexual relationships. I was kind of like the man in the relationship. I, I was, this is where I got the, I was able to more hone in on the bipolar diagnosis because I was having like a lot of, there's a lot of promiscuity before I got a handle on things. And I used to say like, I'm not like this. I was saving sex for marriage. This isn't me. I don't know what's going on, but then I'd be out here doing whatever on all these different dating sites, just very risky, irresponsible behavior. And then when I put two and two together with the bipolar diagnosis and I realized, oh, this is what I do when I'm having manic episodes. I'm taking part in risky behaviors. I'm doing things I wouldn't normally do. Um, but with the help of a great therapist, I started to work through some of those things and really get down to the meat of the issue. And that made all the difference. That's why I encourage people. Like I said, medication is not for everybody. Um, I personally can't function without my medications, but I know that they don't work for everybody. And some people just are not open to them. But I encourage everybody to try therapy. I honestly think that it's intrinsic to everybody's journey, whether you have a formal diagnosis or not. Did we have our Spellbin sister back on? <laughs> Not that I went. <laughs> I'm here. Thank you. I have, a, I have another little thing I think that can help with mood. Should you suffer from it? Having a pet, that's actually a protective factor for um, dealing with any kind of mental conditions, having a pet. Um, so just another thing to add to the list. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer. Thank you for the entire panel. You guys are awesome. And Shanae, thank you so much for being open with your um, with everything. I wanted to put another face to people, Black women who suffer from an, a mental illness, um, which has been named one of the three. I The reason why I'm not too open about it was that I was diagnosed in 1998. There was not much information back then. People during that time were stigmatized. Now a lot of people are coming out and I, I don't have, I'm bipolar. So I'm bipolar too. And it happened when I was actually, I was diagnosed when I had finished my first year of law school. What I didn't know was that in a lot of professional school settings, there are many students who have anxiety, mental, undiagnosed mental health issues. One of my classmates told me this, who was also bipolar too. Unfortunately, 15 years after we graduated from school, she committed suicide. She was not black, she, she was white woman, but it's still the fact that she had a mental illness, which was being addressed. But the whole reason why I wanted to come out was first, I'm a black person, I got it. Two, yes, I'm on medication. But one of the main things I have learned through all this is you really need to get your sleep. If you do not get your sleep, you, are, you will not be functional. I don't care if you have it or not, get your sleep. 
And two, make sure you are on some type of eating routine at least to have your breakfast. If you don't have at least those two things, you are not gonna be productive, especially during this time of COVID. Third, I am a caregiver living with all this inside with my mother who is 81 years old. I'm dealing with a lot of stuff, but you know what I do? Thank God for Helen, for having this, these Zoom chats. For me as a caregiver, where I don't trust some of the people who don't understand my situation, I created a caregiver group for all of us who speak openly. So I'm just putting this out there for those of you who might be dealing with other issues you don't know who to turn to reach out to some of us have these conversations because it's good to just branch out so thanks for letting me talk and hi okay bye <laughs> thank you so much miss <laughs> um, hickey yeah. um i think based on what jennifer just talked about can people talk a little bit more about um the stigma um my friend from rhode island roberta haskins had posted a question in the chat a little bit ago about, you know, the, the stigma around saying that you've been in therapy, you know, I mean, or that you have um, a serious mental illness. Um, let's, let's address that question to, to Chanel since she's still with us. Chanel, can you take that question? Uh, absolutely. Um, so when it when it comes to stigma, so I will say this, I'm noticing an interesting trend since the pandemic. Um, not only with since the pandemic, but with this new generation. I think we're in Gen Z now. Um, I think what's happening is that we still have stigma, but this new generation is becoming so much more open and accepting about therapy and everything that has to do with it, like blatantly open about it, right? Um, now, parts of that is scary because some of them are learning from social media. Um, and I'm following social media doctors and therapists and stuff like that. So you 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 know you have that aspect where some of the generation is living their life off of memes, but you have the other aspect where I think that this generation is really really shattering stigma. And I'm not sure that they're trying to do it purposefully. I think they're just being open and honest and, and about embracing mental health in a different way. Because I think a lot of the stigma has come from that has been a generational historical kind of thing. Like, you know, if we're talking about like, there's so much that this conversation can go into, first of all, like there's so many avenues, but if we're just talking about Black people and if we're just talking about Black families, you know, it's been identified as weakness and we fell into this trap kind of like we said before with the whole Superman, Superwoman syndrome, right? And so therapy seemed like that thing for crazy people, right? Um, one of my first... Um, one of my first clinical experiences when I had an internship um, and a clinical supervisor helped me to see that that mental health is divided into, she divided it into two subsets. And she said, one, you have those who have serious mental illnesses, who have serious psychiatric illnesses that they need to deal with. And I think generationally, that's the only side of mental health we have ever seen. Serious psychiatric things, right? Because that's what the movie shows you. The movie shows you asylums and they show you hospitals and they say, they show you people in straight jackets and stuff like that, right? And so that is what has been seen and so when people approach mental health that scared them off because it's like no I'm not that I'm not you know psyche I'm not psychotic but there was this other side that's now being embraced that took a while to which she called the worried well so she said we have the 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 serious mental illness and then we have those who fall into a category called the worried well and that would be a lot of us right maybe you don't have a serious uh, mental illness in terms of you know a very serious diagnosis a psychiatric psychosis or something like that but you're dealing with life you're dealing with the transitions of life. Maybe you had a loss, right? Um, and we would fall into the category of the worried well. And I think what's happening is, is as the worried well are starting to embrace mental health and being okay with talking about it, that is what's helping to shatter stigma. And so that becomes all of our responsibility and being okay about it. Kind of like what I said earlier, it's about healing me to heal we. When I'm honest about my journey and speaking up about it, what it does is it frees other people to to feel open to speak up about it I tell people all the time even as a therapist you bet your bottom dollar Chanel McCord also has a therapist 
I am a therapist with a therapist and I am okay with that because I believe I, I'm still human, right? We just talked about that. I'm still human. And so making sure that I handle that and I'm very open and okay with letting people know that I see a therapist. I even let my clients know. One, it humanizes me, but two, it lets them know. I don't care what where you are in life or, or, or what your position or what your role is in. We all need help. We all have some things that we can work on. And as Shanae said, therapy doesn't hurt anybody. And so I think that while there is still yet a lot of stigma, this new generation is really working in such a way where they are in, in a lot of ways, I don't wanna say drowning it out, but they are kind of drowning it out because they are embracing it so much. And so, yes, we have a long way to go with stigma from that old mindset and understanding that therapy is not just insane asylums, right? because that's what a lot of people still think of therapy, which is where the stigma actually came from. It's not just insane asylums. Therapy is so much more than that. As a matter of fact, it's all around us. It's everybody walking this earth, right? And I think that as we start to approach it from that aspect and that understanding, it's going to free more people up. But we got to have spaces like this and conversations like this, because if nobody talks about it, then it still becomes this taboo thing. But the more we talk about it, the more that we're open and honest about our own journeys, it frees other the people up to do so as well. Yeah, and I can co-sign that. Um, I think well, a lot of you know that I teach um, undergrad. I teach juniors and seniors, and mostly seniors in college. And when I was in school back in the 80s, if anybody was on therapy or, or taking therapy or on medication, nobody, you didn't want people, nobody knew. And these kids, they just you know, I teach ethics, so and, and I'm teaching. They're going to be future social workers and therapists and that kind. And um, they just very nonchalantly say that, oh, yeah, my therapist, oh, yeah, all of them. And they share it very freely. So it's, it's refreshing. It's definitely a different um, day in terms of, of not being ashamed of being in therapy. So thank you all for sharing. Um, Ms. Weatherly, you're next. Muriel? Yeah, yes, a actually you, uh, Chanel, just hit the nail on the head. That was my uh, question. Um, how do families tackle uh, shattering generational differences in assessing mental health? You know, like the older generation, which is me, you know, the 50 and older club and even older, we were always told to just suck it up. There's nothing wrong with you, pray about it, keep moving on, oh, you're weak, you're weak. But like she said, I have a generational Z son and I'm very open, I have therapists in my family, but it's hard to bring family on board to support uh, mental health. But Chanel just hit the nail absolutely on the head. Yes, absolutely. They're too casual with it. I think sometimes, Dr. Erica, what do you think? I mean, they are just very forthcoming. And when they do their presentations and they love to share their own personal journeys, and I tell them, do that with caution. Yes. Doesn't, <laughs> everybody doesn't protect your, but I don't think they, they're not as concerned about it as, as my generation was. I think they're fearless. I think that generation is fearless. You know, they're very open, they're very transparent, and you know, I think what I, it's amazing how many kids I have who will tell their parents they need to come see me. Yeah. And their parents will say, you know, my, my daughter found you. <laughs> so they are looking up the resources, you know, they're not afraid to share their stories. I think for some of those who are in, you know, and I'm in Gen Z, I mean, Gen X, excuse me, the oh. X Xennial cusp um, and above, I think we just, there's still so much shame associated with um, mental health and with the stigma, you know, and when we are internalizing our mental health conditions as a weakness, then yeah, we feel ashamed about it because we're telling ourselves, I should, I can't tell you how many times I hear people tell me this, but Dr. Erica, I should be able to get over this. I should be able to push through it. I should be able to function. I shouldn't be depressed. I should. I have everything going for me. I shouldn't feel this way. And I'm like, you're getting yourself into this should shame cycle that if unless we break that, we're gonna have to at some point let go of the shame yeah. and give ourselves some grace, give ourselves some compassion that you've been through a lot, sis. You've been through a lot and your genetic loading 
you got a mom who had depression, a grandmom who had depression, an auntie with anxiety disorder, a cousin who completed suicide. So with your biological DNA and all the stress you're dealing with, yeah, that's why it's manifesting as such. It's not your fault. We blame ourselves for struggling, but we don't do that when it comes to other medical conditions. We accept it. It's like, oh man, okay, I got a broken arm. Guess I need to go to this doctor. I need to get a reset, right? If we have heart disease. All right, let me go see whoever I need to see if we have diabetes. And I love comparing mental conditions, psychiatric conditions, which are brain disorders. Again, this is biological, y'all. If we are treating that like any other organ in our body, yeah, there are going to be times when we will say, okay, I have diabetes. That makes sense. Everybody in my family had diabetes. So now I need to make sure I, I do get the treatment for it. But we're not shaming ourselves for that. But we hold so much shame for mental illness. So my prayer, my hope is that we can let go of the shame should cycle and really be able to give ourselves some grace and compassion so that we can give ourselves permission to take care of ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So I see three more hands. I don't want to keep the doctor. She's so gracious. We don't want to take and Shanae as well. And Ms. McCord, thank you all so much. Um, so we're going to get through these last three questions. If you have other stuff, drop it in the chat. Um, one question I want you to answer um, as we go forward, um, Dr. Erica, is that um, I think Black women want Black therapists. And I know that you are open to new patients, but you can't take everybody. So mm -hmm. if you are looking for, if you can just share with us, and not necessarily now, but you know, where um, are some places that people can look for specifically Black yeah. therapists? So um, I am, um, fortunately, I am at my capacity and I don't have any other space to, to add on anyone, but my website is there that way, you know, if you need me maybe in a couple of months. I do specialize with young adults, children, adolescents. So I see a lot. I actually work a lot with medical students. Um, I work a lot with graduate students, PhD students, master's students, um, folks who are just transitioning from working from um, being in school to, you know, being young entrepreneurs or, you know, joining the workforce, um, which they have really dealt with a lot, I think, during the pandemic. Could you imagine graduate, graduating with a master's and then not having a job lined up? Um, I had to deal a lot with that. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the age range. I specialize, I see a lot of individuals and women with um, eating disorders as well. So they're not that many black psychiatrists or therapists that do eating disorders work. So I do a lot of that. Um, but yeah, I'll probably be opening back up in around July or so. But again, check out psychologytoday.com, stratify it according to race, therapy for black girls. That's usually, those are the two main resources I'm usually giving folks. But I like psychology today because you can also stratify it according to the types of therapy. You know, so if you have PTSD or trauma and you really want something that's not so much talk therapy, maybe you want EMDR or maybe you want art therapy, you know, you can look in psychology today. OK, who are the art therapists in the area and which of those art therapists are black? And, and also, sometimes we may not be able to find resources depending on where you live. We may not be able to find doctors or therapists who are black. The main thing we want to make sure the doctors and therapists that we see are culturally aware and if they have that cultural awareness and humility, then we can really get good work done, even with someone who doesn't necessarily reflect our racial identity. So I want to throw that out there too. Thank you. I'm thinking if I can, if I can Wait, throw a note in there with Dr. Erica just said, I also wanted to um, also say this, it, just because a therapist is black also does not mean they are culturally competent. Mm -hmm. um, and that's important to understand because a lot of people, a lot of Black people are looking for Black therapists. Um, and then sometimes, and I'm not saying this is always the case, and sometimes are disappointed because they feel like it wasn't the experience that they were expecting. And then it stifles them for seeking therapy. Um, it is so important that you do consult calls when you are seeking therapists. And I always tell people when you're seeking therapists, call at least three to five and try to have at least three to five consults consult calls with different people to see a fit from the beginning, to see if you feel like you connect with that person, 
ask the questions that you want and don't just rush into it because that therapeutic relationship makes all the difference in the world and making sure that um, you get the help that you need. If you don't click with your therapist, if there isn't a fit, you won't. And a lot of times what happens is people don't have that therapeutic fit and, it, and then they're just like, forget it. I'm not going to even do this anymore. Um, and I don't want people to do that. So make sure that you do your due diligence and research. And yes, I'm all for that Black therapist. I'm a Black therapist. I have a group practice of Black therapists, so I'm all for it. But something that um, Dr. Erica just said, which is really important, you may not always be able to find one. And it doesn't mean that a therapist of another race cannot help you. So I know some very talented therapists of other races as well, who do some amazing, amazing work. Like I work with them on the side as well. So the goal is to get into therapy. Like that is the goal. Get the help that you need and don't be stifled because, you know, if they're not culturally competent or if you can't find a, a Black therapist. So just something to consider. Excellent, excellent point. Um, I, go ahead, uh, I, just, I just want to say that the other le young lady, Angela Wyatt, she is an art therapist. I don't know if she's still on the call or not, but she is part of our planning committee. She's an art therapist. I just want to put that plug out for my girl. Angela, <laughs> you're not plugging for you. Where is she? I think she's gone. She's gone, I think. Hey everyone, I'm so sorry, but unfortunately I do have to run, but it's been an honor. Um, these are amazing questions, you guys. I love what you're doing. I love the platform. I love the sisterhood. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. you. Thank, thank you. So much, Dr. Erica. Oh, for come again as a guest. Okay. Okay. Time in with Black Sisters, you need it too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Erica. Have a good evening. So Deborah, I'm not sure what your question was and hopefully um, uh, we still have Chanel here and we still have Shanae here. So go ahead, Ms. Scott, with your question. Well, my question was, um, I do take therapy. I have a therapist um, because I suffer from PTSD, anxiety and trauma. Um, but this week was traumatizing to me with the um, Will and Jada because I have alopecia. And a lot of people don't understand about alopecia. Alopecia is a debilitating for us because it's our crown. It's our hair. You feel a certain way. And just, I am glad that they brought light to it because people need to understand that this is an immune condition and to be made fun of, or even for you because of my PTSD, I look at myself a certain way because I also, Sinead, was sexually abused. So a lot of things that has come about, at least we have opened up the discussion because the discussion needed to be had because I felt like it wasn't about her alopecia. I felt it was about a joke that turned into something for sympathy. But I just want people to know there are people out there like us who have alopecia and we do not like to be made fun of. So I just wanted to say that. Thank and you. I was going to ask Shanique a question, but that's it. Go ahead. What's your question for Shani? For Shani? No, and, no, I was just wondering for me, how does it, because that's a hot button. And like I said, I do go to therapy and everything, but sometimes you hold on to things, like she said, you internalize. And I'm like the other caller. I don't necessarily want to take, I take Zoloft all the time. So I take it when I need it and then I stop. But what has helped me, and I want people to know this too, is that I took a class called Credible Messengers. And that class taught me that hurt people hurt people. So sometimes it just finding within yourself that road to take for your own recovery also helps. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. I'm loving everybody being so forthcoming. Um, Miss Simmons and Maxine, did you, you, your hand was up. I don't see you anymore. I don't know if she left or not. Miss no, Simmons. I'm still on. Okay. Did you still have a question? I don't see your I, hand. Well, I think you answered it. My question was that my primary care, I asked him if I, I wanted to see a therapist and he referred me to a white therapist. And like, like the one sister was saying, that's okay if they're culturally aware or culturally co competent, but I asked if I could see an African-American female counselor. And I want to know if any of the sisters could give me some, some reasons for that, because he wants to know why. And I said, because that's what I want. <laughs> and that's what I feel more comfortable with. Are there any more reasons that, that we should have for wanting to see someone who looks like me and I feel more likely to, to share my, my culture, I guess? 
I'm surprised someone in the medical profession, that tells you that they're out of tune because yeah. if they're in the medical profession, they should know that there's a distrust with black people across yeah. the world. So they should not respond in that way to that question. But, um, you know, a Shanae or, or, or Chanel, um, yeah, um, can one of you guys, if you ladies want to take that question? Yes, yes, no. Chanel. I'm personally surprised by that question. Oh, I'm sorry, Chanel, were you speaking? I, I'm no, sorry, I, I was in, I'm in transition, so I didn't hear the question, but go ahead, Chanel, you got it. <laughs> All right, boo. Um, I have never had that question posed to me before. I have gone to um, non-persons of color and it wasn't a comfortable experience for me, um, which is why I now have a policy that I only see people of color in every aspect, not just um, my therapist and psychiatrist, but my primary doctor, my dentist, my every medical person you could think of, they're skin folk. <laughs> just because of the experiences that I've had. And yes, I'm also mindful of the, um, you know, the stigma and also the health disparities that exist. Um, also just, you know, some of the stigma about how black people in general are treated and by medical professionals. Um, it makes me a little wary to go to someone that doesn't look like me because um, sometimes things are missed. They're, sometimes they're so focused on my weight that they don't take the time to look at my family history and see, well, maybe X, Y, Z is why um, she has high cholesterol or you know, she needs to get X, Y, Z checked. Um, it's really interesting to me. So I've kind of made it my personal mission to only deal with people of color when it comes to my medical needs. Um, and I found that it makes a profound difference in the care that I receive. And it's not to say that there aren't white care professionals out there that can't offer the same services. But um, for me personally, I've got to go with the ones that make me feel comfortable that understand some of the health concerns that are intrinsic to black people like diabetes like my optometrist knows to keep an eye on my eyes because I did have type 2 diabetes at one point and that can lead to a lot of eye issues um, someone else might not have looked at those things and it's just you know very important to me but I can't understand why a medical professional would want you to give any more reason than what you already did about your comfort level yeah. it's like yeah he just said he just says, says they're all competent and they're all you know and they all have I guess can and handle was, my he, situation. And he was not black, I'm sure. True. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I, yeah. So that's yeah, not funny. I would insensitive. If you got to explain that to him, then something's wrong with him. That's how I see it. Yeah. Okay, Thank you, Miss Max. Okay, Miss Simmons, you're our last question. What you got for us? Okay, so I just, uh, what brought to mind a person, a couple people ago said, brought up the issue about the alopecia and, and with uh, Jada. And I, I just found it interesting of all the discussions that I've heard uh, since last Sunday. Um, I only heard one person address the issue of, um, we had just undergone two weeks of seeing a very competent, beautiful black woman be under attack. And so um, I've heard people say, well, why would Will do this? And I, and I do not uh, condone violence, let me say that. But I haven't heard people ask the question, why would a black man say to a black woman before 16 million people something about her hair, particularly one that did a film on hair? Doesn't mm -hmm. he know how sensitive we are about this? I haven't heard people ask that question. Just wanted to, maybe it's just me. What What are other people's thoughts? <laughs> uh, that's, a, well, that's a hot button and we can get into a whole nother hour. So we're not going to touch it, but we will deal with that. I actually, we, uh, one of my um, colleagues, uh, friends did a call on Friday night to talk about that. And I didn't blast it. Um, I just sent it to people who I knew. For those of you who are, are who are not on our Google group, you might want to um, send me your email address so I can add you because we get into some very lively discussions, and that was definitely one of them for the week. Um, but there's a lot of issues in the in the Jada thing. And I mean, I can say it's Jada. See there, we're putting her in it. There's a lot of issues in that. Um, you know, the intraracial. Um, you know, um, Will was very comfortable approaching another black man. Would he have done that had it not been? You have a class privilege issue. 
Um, trust me, I told my students uh, for once, um, uh, class trump, not for once, but in this instance, class trump breaks. And I told them, don't even try that. You will be arrested on the spot. And we must recognize, too, from a legal perspective, that Will still runs the risk of being arrested. So he's not out of the woods yet. Even if Chris decides that he doesn't want to press charges, if the DA so chooses, or if he's getting a lot of pressure from people who want to remind um, Will that, you know what, you still black. We don't care how much money you got. And you scared us. You're supposed to be a safe Negro. And you went off the rails. <laughs> oh, uh, there, it's just so much we can have. And I'm really hoping that I can get um, Sister Sonia Sanchez to come talk with us next week. And that's one of the things that I want her to talk about. I want to talk about, you know, Black women who felt that um, who felt that somehow what Will did was protecting Black women. And a lot of women feel that way. So let's talk about it. What does it look like? What do we want from our Black men in terms of protecting us and so forth? And the whole alopecia thing, you know, my opinion is I don't think that Chris knew that she had alopecia. And um, it was probably an innocuous joke about I've never seen, what's the movie? Um, with the ball, what's the movie he talked about? I forgot all the G.I. Jane. G.I. Jane. Jane, yes. I've never seen that, but apparently it was a compliment because Demi Moore was bald headed and G.I. Jane was a kick ass and take no stuff. So I don't know. I, I think there was something else going on there. And the other thing that's very interesting from a woman, Black woman's perspective, so many people are down on Jada and Black women are in that, in that, um, asking, you know, in that, um, Circuit, circle too, very upset with her. And that's something else that we need to explore, like why? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be, um, but it's just very interesting that we, some women, I'm just surprised. I know them to be very pro-Jada, pro-woman, and they still feel like Jada did not protect her man. So there's a lot that we can talk about around that, and we will. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for that question. Did anybody else want to add anything about alopecia? I think that was her real. And alopecia is real, and it's not just alopecia. You know, I know in the, um, in the iris that we are not our hair, but that's not true. We are. Uh, we have internalized our hair. Hair is very, I, I have people say, oh, you have so much hair. My hair isn't half as thick and beautiful as it used to be. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I know that when my hair changed, a piece of me changed too. So hair is real, you know, um, it is what it is. So it's something that we definitely want to talk about. And I'm sure everybody here has an opinion on that subject and it will be a yeah. hot topic. <laughs> I see one more hand. Myra, go ahead and you can be brief so we can let everybody get on with their evening. Oh, I can. I, you said something about another group, and I don't know about another group, so I wanted to know what, what exactly were you talking about? Oh, yes. Yeah. So for When Black Women Gather, we have a Facebook page, um, and I have a website. I need to get with the program, but my friend just upgraded, and I still haven't released it, which is ridiculous. Um, but we also have a Google group. So it can be overwhelming. So if you are in the Google group and you find the messages that you're getting overwhelming, please let me know. I can change it. I can take you off. I'm not offended in any kind of way. Just say, hell, take me off this list. Or I can change your messages so that you, you get them as a digest. So instead of getting messages every day, you'll get some comp compilation of, of text emails that came through during the week. But the Google group is just that. Um, Myra, if you send me your email address, I will add you to the Google group and um, women, because people send me emails and wanting me to, to share stuff, I just can't keep on top of it. So anything that you want to share or just any conversation just happens on the Google group. So if anybody who wants to, um, you know, um, and, and unfortunately they only let you add like 50 a day. And I'm like, you know what, just let me add. I have like over 2000 names. I just want to add 2000 names and be done with it. <laughs> So uh, right now it's about 900 women on and I'm not even sure who's on and who isn't on at this point. So if you're interested, just send me your email and I will add you graciously to that list. And when you don't, if it becomes overwhelming, let me know. So thank you, Ms. Myra. What information do you need? Just your email. I just send me an email. Send me an email and say, Helen, add me to the Google group. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All righty. This has been a First of all, can we give our hostesses with the mostest a round of applause? That would be Miss Michelle Burgess, Miss Kilthia Roberts, and I think Miss Angela Wyatt. Does she leave us? I think she's gone. So
So you all cannot I mute. She's on. I think she's on. Is she here? Yeah, I think I just saw her face. I just can't figure out how to pull her back up. Oh, wait a minute. I think I can get her back in. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm still here. I had there to come back. You are. All right. There you are. Okay. Thank you, ladies, for pulling this together. You did a fantastic, very professional job. And I just kind of sat back and watched you do your thing. So that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you again to our guest speakers, Shanae. Thank you so much for being so forthcoming with your story because that's not easy to do. And mm. um, trust me, you inspired, I'm sure, a whole lot of people who have stories that you know we need to be more comfortable with telling and you know throw away the stigmas that come with it. And Miss Ford, um, Ford, Miss McCord, you're still here. I can't keep track of. Yeah, looks like she's gone. Um, so yeah, so all of our guests were just wonderful and thank you, thank you so much for coming. And I am going to um, end, end this recording and, and then give you just a few updates about what's coming in the next weeks. And um, we will have this available on our YouTube channel. I'll be sure and post it. I owe you a few videos. I will get them out there, I promise you. This will be one of them. And uh, before we go, before we sign off, is there any burning question or anything that somebody wants to get answered before we go? Hmm, I'm thinking. I don't um, have anything today. Oh, that's, that's Linda who doesn't have something? That's amazing. Right, does, does Angela have anything to tell us about the art therapy? So Angela, what I did, when you weren't on the call, but somebody mentioned, they mentioned art therapy as a modality. And I said, oh, Angela Wyde, who's part of the committee, is an art therapist. So well, that put your email in the chat. I heard, Shanae, uh, okay. you mentioned that some people did art therapy as a way of, for ther you know, therapeutic as a um, modality, I think, when you were talking. Yeah. Well, um, I was listening to everything and what everyone said today, and I thought it was um, fantastic. Um, I did. I was an art major in college, and then after college, I went into. I worked a, um, a psychiatric hospital. Actually, it was in Cedar Grove, um, Overbrook, um, and that's where I did an art therapy internship. And basically, what it was, what it's about, is instead of being talk. Therapy, it's more where you're putting your ideas down, you're um, painting your different modalities that you can use um, to get out your feelings as opposed to being able, because I worked at um, Putnam ARC. It used to be called Putnam Association for Retarded Citizens. It then changed to Resource Center, but I had different types of people from schizophrenia to um, all types of duly diagnosed people. And what I would do is I worked along with the psychiatrist and in talking to people who are having serious psychiatric um, issues because many of them lived in a group home, they were on medication. Um, by doing artwork, it was a way for them to express their feelings, how they felt, as opposed to being able to talk to a therapist like you or I could do. It's a way of them getting out what's going on. Um, I'm looking into, I right, right now I'm doing something else, working as a companion and doing art, but I'm looking into branching out and just doing my own art therapy again and working with, uh, sure. with different types of people who, I think women who are depressed, I've tended to be working with more women who are depressed um, and also women who have gone into early Alzheimer's because they're losing their memory and that's the group that I've been kind of working with lately. And I think I might go to that group more, but- um, Angela, drop your, um, drop your information in the chats um, and let people know where they can get in touch with you if they want to do therapy, that would be great. Um, and I don't know- Right now, I, can, I don't have a website yet, but I can put my telephone number, email address, I'll put that in. Okay, very good. And I see Renee Mills has dropped her information. She also does art therapy. So anybody on the call, if you're doing work that's related to this or just something, and, and Lola, if you're still on the call, please drop your information about your teas because that's therapy. Um, okay. Yeah, and several women have gotten yeah. teas 
from Lola, and that has been very helpful. So, wait a minute, Linda, somebody just had, Janet Morrison, did you go away? I saw your hand was up. Did you want to ask a question, Janet? Is she, is she gone? Can you all see if she's still here? She is still here. Janet, did you have a question? Go ahead, Linda. No, just to those who do art therapy and somebody had mentioned Alzheimer's. Um, the reason why I asked to see if there's any more information, I had heard a couple of years ago in England, there was a facility built for people with Alzheimer's. And one of the things they did was use the color red throughout the building to help people navigate like their daily lives. And I just wanted to know if anybody knew anything about um, uh, who, who was involved in art therapy, knew anything about that facility that's in England. I think it's in London, England, and is geared to people with Alzheimer's and they use the color red. Um, to help a great deal in terms of, you know, making them or helping them be somewhat independent. I haven't heard of that, but I need to, I'll have to check that, Google that and find out. I can get back, you know, I can find that information out though. Okay. okay. All righty then. So we are going to end this session of the call and just stick around for a few more minutes. We can talk about what's coming up. Uh, Helen, Janet's hand is back up. I'm sorry, who? Jan Janet's hand is back up, Janet Morrison. Ahead, Janet, we can hear you, Janet, go ahead. I don't see her hand even. Janet, did you, oh, you're on mute, Janet. You have to, you need to unmute your, yourself. In the old days, we used to be able to unmute people, but I can see why they, they took that ability away because you would violate people's privacy. Janet, are you able to unmute yourself? Um, I'm just, I'm Hello, just gonna... this is Lola. I just sent my um, phone number on the chat. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lola. Janet, I'm just gonna say whatever your question is, I'm not sure why you can't unmute yourself, but drop your question in the chat and maybe we can answer it before we close out. Um, I'm not sure why you can't unmute yourself. Um, okay, so on that note, ladies, I'm just going to say again, thank you, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us yet again. Linda, you weren't on at the beginning. We are into, um, oh, what week is this? It's two years and two weeks. <laughs> Our first yeah. session was March 22, 2020. 2020. And I, I didn't realize that our two year anniversary had passed. So we're well over, I'm sure we have over a hundred programs and it's just been a, a wonderful ride. And thank you all for Linda jokes that um, we have actually been at this longer than some TV series. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for- And some uh, marriages. Yeah, and how about that, right? Yeah, so. Um, so thank you all who have made this uh, venture be uh, joyful and successful. And on that note, I'm going to say good night. Thank our ladies again for pulling this together for me and encourage that if anybody has an idea, please let me know. There's a few things that are coming up, which I think you're going to find very interesting. Um, and I'm not sure we're going to have a program on a April 24th, unless Linda's going to chair it because I won't be available. <laughs> but we'll, I haven't even talked to Linda about that. I just threw that on her. Um, so anyway, thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and um, hang around for just a minute or so more and we'll be done. When Black women gather, what happens? Amazing. 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 Yeah. Amazing. yeah. Thank you for coming to our amazing. <laughs> Congratulations, Miss Higgy. Oh, in two years, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good, good job. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one second. We're going to stop the recording.